This is Audible. Audio Renaissance presents The Psychology of Self-Esteem by Nathaniel Brandon, read by the author. Hello. In his quest to understand the universe in which he lives, man is confronted with three fundamental facts of nature, the existence of matter, of life, and of consciousness. In response to the first of these phenomena, he developed the sciences of physics and chemistry. In response to the second, he developed the science of biology. In response to the third, he developed the science of psychology. It is notorious that, to date, the greatest advances in knowledge have been achieved in the field of physics, the least in the field of psychology. As a being who possesses the power of self-consciousness, the power of contemplating his own life and activity, Man experiences a profound need for a conceptual frame of reference from which to view himself. He has a need for a self-intelligibility which it is the task of psychology to provide. This program is offered as a step toward the achievement of that goal. Before we proceed any further, I should like to clarify that, in this program, the word man does indeed include both men and women. I use the word man simply to increase this audiobook's ease of listening. The more inclusive person, or he-she, tends to lend an awkwardness to the spoken word. So then, the central theme of this tape is the role of self-esteem in man's life. The need of self-esteem, the nature of that need, the conditions of its fulfillment, and the consequences of its frustration. We'll also explore the impact of a man's self-esteem, or lack of it, on his values, responses, and goals. Virtually all psychologists recognize that man experiences a need of self-esteem. But what they have not identified is the nature of self-esteem, the reasons why man needs it, and the conditions he must satisfy if he is to achieve it. Virtually all psychologists recognize, if only vaguely, that there is some relationship between the degree of a man's self-esteem and the degree of his mental health, but they have not identified the nature of that relationship nor the causes of it. Virtually all psychologists recognize, if only dimly, that there is some relationship between the nature and degree of a man's self-esteem and his motivation, that is, his behavior in the spheres of work, love, and human relationships, but they have not explained why nor identified the principles involved. Such are the issues with which this program deals. Writing in the early years of the 20th century, the German psychologist Hermann Ebbinghaus made an observation that has become famous. Quote, Psychology has a long past, but only a short history. Unquote. His statement was intended to acknowledge the fact that, throughout recorded history, men have been intensely concerned with issues and problems of a psychological nature but that psychology as a distinct scientific discipline emerged only in the second half of the 19th century. Up to that time, the domain of psychology had not been isolated as such and studied systematically. It existed only as a part of philosophy, medicine, and theology. What is the science of psychology? How is it to be defined? What is its specific domain? Psychology is the science that studies the attributes and characteristics which certain living organisms possess by virtue of being conscious. Consciousness is used here in its widest and most general sense to indicate the faculty and state of awareness, of any form of awareness. This range includes the complex mode of cognition possible to man to the far more limited range of awareness possible to a frog. The more complex and highly developed the nervous system of a given species, the greater is the range of its consciousness. Man's is the most highly developed nervous system, and his is the widest range of awareness. The chimpanzees is less, the cats still less, the frogs still less. While psychology is concerned with all conscious organisms, it is primarily concerned with the study of man. Man's defining attribute, which distinguishes him from all other living species, is his ability to reason. This means to extend the range of his awareness beyond the perceptual concretes immediately confronting him, to abstract, to integrate, to grasp principles, 
to apprehend reality on the conceptual level of consciousness. An animal's range is only as wide as its percepts. The rudimentary forms of inference of which it may be capable are entirely dependent on the physical cues within its immediate sensory field in the context of past experience. It cannot conceptualize, it cannot initiate a process of question asking, it cannot project a chain of inference that is independent of immediate sensory stimuli. But man can chart on the back of an envelope the motion of planets through the outer reaches of space. Like every other species that possesses awareness, man survives by the guidance of his distinctive form of consciousness, by the guidance of his conceptual faculty. This is the first fact about man's nature that must be understood. This is the starting point of any scientific study of man, the basic principle without which no aspect of the distinctively human can be understood. Whether one is seeking to understand the nature of emotion, or the psychology of family relationships, or the causes of mental illness, or the meaning of love, one must begin by identifying the fact upon which any subsequent analysis of man necessarily rests. That is, that man is a rational being, a being whose distinctive form of consciousness is conceptual. Thus psychology, as it pertains to man, is properly conceived and defined as the science that studies the attributes and characteristics which man possesses by virtue of his rational faculty. From the simplest unicellular animal to man, the most complex of organisms, all living entities possess a characteristic structure, the component parts of which function in such a way as to preserve the integrity of that structure, thereby maintaining the life of the organism. When an organism ceases to perform the actions necessary to maintain its structural integrity, it dies. For all living entities, action is a necessity of survival. Life is motion, a process of self-sustaining action that an organism must carry on constantly in order to remain in existence. Biologically, inactivity is death. The action that an organism must perform is both internal, as in the process of metabolism, and external, as in the process of seeking food. An organism maintains itself by exercising its capacities in order to satisfy its needs. An organism's needs are those things which the organism by its nature requires for its life and well-being. An organism's capacities are its inherent potentialities for action. When a physical or psychological need fails to be fulfilled, the result is danger to the organism. However, needs differ in the degree of their urgency and in the form of the threat which they potentially pose. This is most easily seen in the case of physical needs, but the principle applies to all needs. Man has a need of oxygen and of food, but whereas he can survive for days without food, he can survive for only minutes without oxygen. Man can survive much longer without vitamin C than without water, but both are needs. In some cases, the frustration of a need results in immediate death. In other cases, the process can take years. A need frustration does not have to result in the organism's destruction directly. Instead, it can undermine the organism's overall capacity to live and thus make the organism vulnerable to destruction from many different sources. This principle is important to remember in considering the frustration of psychological needs. A desire or a wish is not the equivalent of a need. The fact that a great many men may desire a thing does not prove that it represents a need inherent in human nature. Needs must be objectively demonstrable. While the task of isolating and identifying man's physical needs is far from completed, biology has made enormous advances in this direction. With regard to the task of isolating and identifying man's mental needs, psychology is in a state of chaos. This chaos serves, however, to emphasize the fact that the nature of man's needs has to be discovered. Needs are not self-evident. Alleged needs must be proven by relating them to the requirements of man's survival. That man possesses psychological needs is indisputable. 
The widespread phenomenon of mental illness is evidence both of the existence of needs which are being thwarted and of the failure of psychology to understand the nature of these needs. The basic problem of motivational psychology may be formulated this way. It is to bridge the gap between needs and goals, to trace the steps from the former to the latter, to understand the connection between them, to understand how needs get translated into goals. It should be obvious that the solution of this problem requires a consideration of man's distinctive capacities. Yet in large measure the history of motivational psychology represents an attempt to bypass man's most distinctively human capacity, his conceptual faculty, and to account for his behavior without reference to the fact that man can reason or that his mind is his basic means of survival. The projection of man as a conscious automaton activated by instincts is one version of this attempt. Instinct is a concept intended to bridge the gap between needs and goals, bypassing man's cognitive ability. As such, it represents one of the most disastrous and sterile attempts to deal with the problem of motivation. Observing certain types of behavior which they believe to be characteristic of the human species, instinct theorists decided that the causes of such behavior are innate, unchosen, and unlearned tendencies which drive man to act as he does. Thus, they spoke of a survival instinct, a parental instinct, an acquisitive instinct, and so forth. They seldom attempted to define precisely what they understood an instinct to be. Still less did they trouble to explain how it functioned. They vied with one another in compiling lists of the instincts their particular theory assumed man to possess, promising to account thereby for the ultimate sources of all human action. To account for a man's actions in terms of undefinable instincts is to contribute nothing to human knowledge. It is only to confess that one does not know why man acts as he does. To observe that men engage in sexual activities and to conclude that man has a sex instinct, to observe that men seek food when they are hungry and to conclude that man has a hunger instinct, to observe that some men act destructively and to conclude that man has a destructive instinct, is to explain nothing. It is merely to place oneself in the same category as the physician in the anecdote who supposedly explains to a distraught mother that the reason why her child will not drink milk is that your child is just not a milk drinker. Man is born with needs, but he is not born with a knowledge of those needs and of how to satisfy them. Some of his simpler body maintenance needs are satisfied automatically given the appropriate physical environment, by the function of his internal organs. An example is the need for oxygen, which is satisfied by the automatic function of his respiratory system. But the broad range of his more complex needs are not satisfied automatically. Man does not obtain food, shelter, or clothing by instinct. To grow food, to build a shelter, to weave cloth, requires consciousness, choice, discrimination, judgment. Man's body does not have the power to pursue such goals of its own volition. It does not have the power purposefully to rearrange the elements of nature, to reshape matter, independent of its consciousness, knowledge, and values. Unsatisfied, unfulfilled needs can set up a state of tension or disquietude or pain in man. This can prompt him to seek biologically appropriate actions, such as protecting himself against the elements. But the necessity of learning what is the appropriate action cannot be bypassed. Man's body only provides him with signals of pain or pleasure, but it does not tell him their causes. It does not tell him how to alleviate one or achieve the other. That must be learned by his mind. Man must discover the actions his life requires. It was not an instinct that enabled man to make fire, to build bridges, to perform surgery, to design a telescope. It was his ability to think. And if a man chooses not to think, if he chooses to risk his life in senseless dangers, to close his eyes rather than open his mind at the sight of any problem, if he chooses to seek escape from the responsibility of reason in alcohol or drugs, or to act in willfully stubborn defiance of his own objective self-interest, he has no instinct that will force his mind to function. 
he has no instinct that will compel him to value his life sufficiently to do the thinking and perform the actions which his life requires. To define man as a rational animal is not to imply that he is an animal who invariably functions rationally. Obviously, he is not. Rather, it is to identify the fact that his fundamental distinguishing characteristic, the attribute that essentially differentiates him from other animals, is his ability to reason, to apprehend reality on the conceptual level of consciousness. One of the most important consequences of man's possession of a conceptual faculty is his power of self-awareness. No other animal is capable of monitoring and reflecting on its own mental operations, of critically evaluating its own mental activity. No other animal is capable of deciding that a given process of mental activity is irrational or illogical, and of altering its subsequent mental operations accordingly. But the same conceptual faculty that confers on man a unique stature compels him to confront unique challenges. No other animal is explicitly aware of the issue of life or death that confronts all organisms. No other animal is aware of its own mortality or has the power to extend its longevity through the acquisition of knowledge. No other animal has the ability and the responsibility to weigh its actions in terms of the long-range consequences for its own life. No other animal has the ability and the responsibility to continually work at extending its knowledge, thereby raising the level of its existence. No other animal faces such questions as, Who am I? How should I seek to live? By what principles should I be guided in my actions? What goals ought I to pursue? What is to be the meaning of my life? The necessity of confronting such issues is essential to the human condition, to everything that is distinctive about man's life. All of man's unique achievements and all of his potential problems are consequences of his possession of the conceptual form of awareness. The relation of man's reason to his survival is the first of two basic principles of man's nature which are indispensable to an understanding of his psychology and behavior. The second is that the exercise of his rational faculty, unlike an animal's use of his senses, is not automatic. The decision to think is not biologically programmed in man. To think is an act of choice. This principle was first formulated by novelist philosopher Ayn Rand this way, quote, The key to human nature is the fact that man is a being of volitional consciousness. Reason does not work automatically. Thinking is not a mechanical process. The connections of logic are not made by instinct. The function of your stomach, lungs, or heart is automatic. The function of your mind is not. In any hour and issue of your life you are free to think or to evade that effort. But you are not free to escape from your nature, from the fact that reason is your means of survival. So that for you, who are a human being, the question, to be or not to be, is the question, to think or not to think. Unquote. In the brain of a normal human being, sensations are automatically integrated into perceptions. That is, they are wired into the nervous system. This is not true of the conceptual level of consciousness. Conceptual awareness is necessary to man's proper survival, but it is not implanted by nature. Man has to select that purpose. He has to direct his mental effort and integrate his mental activity to the goal of conceptual awareness by choice. To engage in an active process of thinking, to abstract, conceptualize, relate, infer, to reason, man must focus his mind. He must set it to the task of active integration. The choice to focus in any given situation is made by choosing to make awareness one's goal, awareness of that which is relevant in the given context. The goal of awareness is set by giving oneself in effect the order, grasp this. That this goal is not wired into man's brain by nature scarcely needs to be argued. One does not need to design special laboratory experiments in order to demonstrate that thinking is not an automatic process, that man's mind does not automatically pump conceptual knowledge 
when and as his life requires it, as his heart pumps blood. The mere fact of being confronted with physical objects and events will not force man to abstract their common properties, to integrate his abstractions, or to apply his knowledge to each new particular he encounters. Man's capacity to default on the responsibility of thinking is too easily observable. He must choose to focus his mind. He must choose to aim at understanding. A man is in focus when and to the extent that his mind is set to the goal of awareness, clarity, intelligibility, with regard to the object of his concern. To sustain that focus with regard to a specific issue or problem is to think. To let one's mind drift in willless passivity, directed only by random impressions, emotions, or associations, or to consider an issue without genuinely seeking to understand it, or to engage in an action without a concern to know what one is doing, this is to be out of focus. What is involved here is not an issue of the degree of a man's intelligence or knowledge, nor is it an issue of the productiveness or success of any particular thinking process, nor is it an issue of the specific subject matter with which the mind may be occupied. Rather, it is an issue of the basic regulating principle that directs the mind's activity. Is the mind controlled by the goal of awareness, or by something else, by wishes, fears, or the pull of lethargic passivity? There are different levels of awareness possible to man's mind, determined by the degree of his focus. The choice to focus or to think does not consist of moving from a state of literal unconsciousness to a state of consciousness. This clearly would be impossible. When one is asleep, one cannot suddenly choose to start thinking. So, to focus is to move from a lower level of awareness to a higher level, to move from relative mental passivity to purposeful mental activity. In the state of passive awareness, a man can apprehend the need to be in full mental focus. His choice is to evade that knowledge or to exert the effort of raising the level of his awareness. The decision to focus and to think once made does not continue to direct a man's mind unceasingly thereafter, with no further effort required. Just as the state of full consciousness must be initiated volitionally, so it must be maintained volitionally. This point can hardly be overemphasized. The choice to think must be reaffirmed in the face of every new issue and problem. The decision to be in focus yesterday will not compel a man to be in focus today. The decision to be in focus about one question will not compel a man to be in focus about another. In any specific thinking process, man must continue to monitor and regulate his own mental activity. In any hour of his life, he is free to suspend the function of his consciousness, to abandon effort, to let his mind drift passively. He is free to maintain only a partial focus, grasping that which comes easily to his understanding and declining to struggle for that which does not. Man is free not only to evade the effort of purposeful awareness in general, but to evade specific lines of thought that he finds disconcerting or painful. Perceiving qualities in his friends or himself that clash with his moral standards, he can surrender his mind to blankness or switch it hastily to some other concern, refusing to identify the meaning or implications of what he has perceived. Grasping that he is pursuing a course of action that is in blatant defiance of reason, he can plunge his mind into fog and continue on his way. In such cases, a man is doing more than defaulting on the responsibility of making awareness his goal. He is actively seeking unawareness as his goal, and this is the meaning of evasion. In the choice to focus or not to focus, to think or not to think, to activate the conceptual level of his consciousness or to suspend it. And in this choice alone is man psychologically free. As focusing involves expanding the range of one's awareness, so evasion consists of the reverse process, of shrinking the range of one's awareness. Evasion consists of refusing to raise the level of one's awareness when one knows that one should, or of lowering the level of one's awareness when one knows that one shouldn't. 
To evade a fact is to attempt to make it unreal to oneself, on the implicit premise that if one does not perceive the fact, it does not really exist, or its existence will not matter and will not entail any consequences. Man's life and well-being depend upon his maintaining a proper cognitive contact with reality, and this requires a full mental focus maintained as a way of life, as a way of being. To be in focus does not mean that one must be engaged in the task of problem-solving every moment of one's waking existence. It means that one must know what one's mind is doing. The more consistently and conscientiously a man maintains a policy of being in full mental focus, of thinking, of judging the facts of reality that confront him, of knowing what he is doing and why, the easier and more seemingly natural the process becomes. The steadily increasing knowledge he acquires as a result of his policy, the growing sense of control over his existence, the growing self-confidence, all serve to put every emotional incentive on the side of his continuing to think. Further, they reduce the possibility of an incentive that could tempt him to evade. It is too clear to him that reality is not, and can never be, his enemy, that he has nothing to gain from self-inflicted blindness, and everything to lose. This does not mean that for such a man the policy of rationality becomes automatic. It will always remain volitional, but he has programmed himself to have every emotional incentive for rationality and none for irrationality. To borrow a phrase from Aristotle, he has learned to make rationality second nature to him. That is the psychological reward he earns for himself. But, and this must be emphasized, his psychological state must be maintained volitionally. He retains the power to betray it. In each new issue he encounters, he still must choose to think. This is the meaning of his free will. Free will, in the widest meaning of the term, is the doctrine that man is capable of performing actions which are not determined by forces outside his control, that man is capable of making choices which are not necessitated by antecedent factors. Man's free will consists of a single basic choice, to focus or not to focus, to think or not to think. This basic choice controls all of man's other choices and directs the course of his actions. His mind is an organ over which man has a specific, delimited, regulatory control. The driver of an automobile can steer the car in the chosen direction, but cannot alter or infringe the mechanical laws by which the car functions. In the same way, man can choose to focus, to aim his cognitive faculty in a given direction, but cannot alter or infringe the psychological laws by which his mind functions. If a man does not steer his car properly, he has no choice about the fact that he will end in a smash-up. Neither has the man who does not steer his mind properly. A man is free to think or not to think, but he is not free to escape the fact that if he fails to think, if he characteristically evades facing any facts or issues which he finds unpleasant, he will set in motion a complex chain of destructive psychological consequences. One of these will be a profound loss of self-esteem. This is a matter of demonstrable psychological law. Or again, if a man forms certain values as a result of his thinking or non-thinking, these values will lead him to experience certain emotions in certain situations. He will not be able to command these emotions out of existence by will. If he recognizes that a specific emotion is inappropriate, he can alter it by rethinking the value or values that evoke it. But he can do so only in a specific manner, not by arbitrary whim. Free will does not mean arbitrary, omnipotent power, unlimited power over the workings of one's own mind. This must be understood. Thus, to the extent that one understands the principles by which man's mind operates, one can predict the psychological consequences of given ideas, values, conclusions, attitudes, and thinking policies. One can predict, for example, that a man of authentic self-esteem will find intellectual stagnation intolerable, that a man who regards sex, life, and himself as evil 
will not be attracted to a woman of intelligence, independence, and guiltless self-confidence. And a man whose guiding policy is, don't antagonize anyone, will not be the first to champion a radical new idea or theory. I have stressed that man's ability to reason is his essential attribute, the attribute which explains the greatest number of his other characteristics. This fact is often obscured by the widespread confusion about the nature and role of emotions in man's life. One frequently hears the statement, Man is not merely a rational being, he is also an emotional being. This implies some sort of dichotomy, as if man possessed a dual nature with one part in opposition to the other. In fact, in the ultimate sense, not in the obvious sense, but in the ultimate sense, the content of man's emotions is the product of his rational faculty. His emotions are a derivative and a consequence which cannot be understood without reference to the conceptual power of his consciousness. As man's tool of survival, reason has two basic functions, cognition and evaluation. The process of cognition consists of discovering what things are, of identifying their nature, their attributes and properties. The process of evaluation consists of man discovering the relationship of things to himself, of identifying what is beneficial to him and what is harmful, what should be sought and what should be avoided. Quoting Ayn Rand in her book, The Virtue of Selfishness, a value is that which one acts to gain and or keep, unquote. It is that which one regards as conducive to one's welfare. A value is the object of an action. Since man must act in order to live, and since reality confronts him with many possible goals, many alternative courses of action, he cannot escape the necessity of selecting values and making value judgments. If a man regards a thing as good for him in some way, he values it, and when possible and appropriate, he seeks to acquire, retain, and use or enjoy it. If a man regards a thing as bad for him in some way, he disvalues it and seeks to avoid or destroy it. If he regards a thing as of no significance to him, as neither beneficial nor harmful, he is indifferent to it and takes no action in regard to it. Although his life and well-being depend on man's selecting values that are in fact good for him, that is, consonant with his nature and needs, there are no internal or external forces compelling him to do so. He is not biologically programmed to make the right value choices automatically. He may select values that are incompatible with his needs and inimical to his well-being, values that lead him to suffering and destruction. But whether his values are life-serving or life-negating, it is a man's values that direct his actions. Values constitute man's basic motivational tie to reality. A man's values are the product of the thinking he has done or has failed to do. Values can be a manifestation of rationality and mental health, or of irrationality and neurosis. They can grow out of self-confidence and benevolence, or out of self-doubt and fear. They can be motivated by the desire to achieve happiness or by the desire to minimize pain. They can be born out of the desire to use one's mind or the desire to escape it. They can be held consciously and explicitly or subconsciously and implicitly. They can be consistent or they can be contradictory. They can further a man's life or they can endanger it. These are the alternatives possible to a being of volitional consciousness. Differences in men's basic values reflect differences in their basic premises, in their fundamental views of themselves, of other men, of existence. Differences in their views of what is possible to them and what they can expect of life. A man's view of himself plays a crucial role in his value choices. For example, a man regards a falling bomb as bad for him because he is aware of his own mortality. If he were physically indestructible, he would appraise the bomb's significance differently. One's conscious or subconscious view of one's own person, whether one appraises oneself correctly or not, is implicit in one's value judgments. The degree of a man's self-confidence or lack of it, and the extent to which he regards the universe as open or closed to his understanding and action, these will necessarily affect the goals he will set for himself, the range of his ambition, his choice of friends, 
the kind of art he will enjoy, and so on. For the most part, the process by which a man's view of himself affects his value choices does not take place on a conscious level. It is implicit in his evaluations, reflecting earlier conclusions which, in effect, are filed in his subconscious. The subconscious is the sum of mental contents and processes that are outside of or below awareness. The subconscious operates as a storehouse of past knowledge, observations, and conclusions. It operates, in effect, as an electronic computer, performing super-rapid integrations of sensory and ideational material. Thus, his past knowledge, provided it has been properly assimilated, can be instantly available to man while his conscious mind is free to deal with the new. This is the pattern of all human learning. Once a man needed his full mental attention to learn to walk. Then the knowledge became automatized and he was free to pursue new skills. Once a man needed his full mental attention to learn to speak. Then the knowledge became automatized and he was enabled to go forward to higher levels of accomplishment. Man moves from knowledge to more advanced knowledge, automatizing his discoveries as he proceeds. He turns his brain into an ever more efficacious instrument if and to the extent that he continues the growth process. A man acquires values and disvalues. These too become automatized. He is not obliged in every situation he encounters to recall all of his values to his conscious mind in order to form an estimate. Example if an experienced motorist perceives an oncoming truck veering toward a collision, he does not need a new act of conscious reasoning in order to grasp the fact of danger. Faster than any thought could take shape in words, he registers the significance of what he perceives, his foot flies to the brake, or his hands swiftly turn the wheel. One of the forms in which these lightning-like appraisals present themselves to man's conscious mind is via his emotions. So next, let's talk about emotions. His emotional capacity is man's automatic barometer of what is for him or against him within the context of his knowledge and values. The relationship of value judgments to emotions is that of cause to effect. An emotion is a value response. It is the automatic psychological result of a super rapid subconscious appraisal. The sequence of psychological events is from perception to evaluation to emotional response. On the level of immediate awareness, however, the sequence is from perception to emotion. A person may or may not be consciously aware of the intervening value judgment. A separate act of focused awareness may be required to grasp it because of the extreme rapidity of the sequence that a person may fail to identify either the judgment or the factors involved in it, that he may be conscious only of the perception and of his emotional response, is the fact which makes possible man's confusion about the nature and source of emotions. Emotions are not tools of cognition. To treat them as such is to put one's life and well-being in danger. What one feels in regard to any fact or issue is irrelevant to the question of whether one's judgment is true or false. It is not by means of one's emotions that one apprehends reality. The mere perception of an object has no power to create an emotion in man, let alone to determine the content of the emotion. The emotional response to an object is inexplicable except in terms of the value significance of the object to the perceiver and this necessarily implies a process of appraisal. For example, three men may look at a scoundrel. The first man recognizes to what extent this person has betrayed his status as a human being and feels contempt. The second man wonders how he can be safe in a world where such persons can prosper and feels fear. The third man secretly envies the scoundrel's success and feels a sneaking admiration. Note that all three men perceive the same object. The differences in their emotional reactions proceed from differences in their evaluation of the significance of what they perceive. Just as emotions are not created by objects of perception as such, so they are not the product of any sort of innate ideas. Having no innate knowledge of what is true or false, man can have no innate knowledge of what is good for him or evil. 
A man's values are a product of the quantity and quality of his thinking. The motivational power and function of emotions is evident in the fact that every emotion contains an inherent action tendency, that is, an impetus to perform some action related to the particular emotion. Love, for example, is a man's emotional response to that which he values highly. It entails the action tendency to achieve some form of contact with the loved person, to interact intellectually, emotionally, physically. The emotion of fear is a man's response to that which threatens his values. It entails the action tendency to avoid or flee from the feared object. The action involved is not always physical. For example, there are feelings of quiet happiness that invoke in man the desire only to remain still and contemplate the source of his happiness or the beauty of the world around him. But every emotion carries some implication for action. This does not mean that the action should necessarily be taken. It may not be possible or appropriate in a given context. We don't have to act on a feeling just because we have it. The action implication of some emotions is negative. That is, they tend specifically to retard or inhibit action. This is evident in the case of acute depression. The person feels that nothing is worth doing, that action is futile, that he is helpless to achieve happiness. The impulse is toward stillness, passivity, withdrawal. Whether a man's emotional mechanism brings him happiness or suffering depends on its programming. It depends on the validity and consistency of his values. His emotional apparatus is a machine. Man is its driver. According to the values he selects, he makes the motivational power of his emotions work in the service of his life or against it. Reason and emotion are not antagonists. What may seem like a struggle between them is only a struggle between two opposing ideas, one of which is not conscious and manifests itself only in the form of a feeling. The resolution of such conflicts is not always simple. It depends on the complexity of the issues involved. But resolutions are achievable, and the necessary first step is to recognize the actual nature of that which needs to be resolved. The guiltless emotional spontaneity that men long for, the freedom from torturing self-doubts, enervating depression, and paralyzing fears, is a proper and achievable goal. But it is possible only on the basis of a rational view of emotions and of their relation to thought. It is possible only if one's emotions are not a mystery, only if one does not have to fear that they may lead one to destruction. It is the reward of a person who has assumed the responsibility of identifying and validating the values that underlie his emotions, the person for whom emotional freedom and openness do not mean the suspension of awareness. The single most formidable obstacle to identifying the roots of one's emotions is repression. Repression is a subconscious mental process that forbids certain ideas, memories, identifications, and evaluations to enter conscious awareness. Repression is an automatized avoidance reaction whereby a man's focal awareness is involuntarily pulled away from any forbidden material emerging from less conscious levels of his mind or from his subconscious. Among the various factors that may cause a person to feel alienated from his own emotions, repression is the most formidable and devastating. But it is not emotions as such that are repressed. An emotion cannot be repressed. If it is not felt, it is not an emotion. Repression is always directed at thoughts. A man can repress the knowledge of what emotion he is experiencing or he can repress the knowledge of its extent and intensity, or he can repress the knowledge of who or what aroused it, or he can repress the reasons of his emotional response, or he can repress conceptual awareness that he is experiencing any particular emotion at all. He can tell himself that he feels nothing. Repression differs from evasion in that evasion is instigated consciously and volitionally. Repression is subconscious and involuntary. In repression, certain thoughts are blocked and inhibited from reaching conscious awareness. They are not ejected from focal awareness, they are prevented from entering it. In order to understand the mechanism of repression, there are three facts pertaining to man's mind that one must consider. 
One, all awareness is necessarily selective. In any particular moment, there is far more in the world around him than a man could possibly focus on. Thus, he must choose to aim his attention in a given direction to the exclusion of others. Two, there are degrees of awareness. There is a gradient of diminishing mental clarity along the continuum from focal awareness to peripheral awareness to total unawareness or unconsciousness. 3. Man is a self-programmer. To an extent immeasurably greater than any other living species, he has the ability to retain, integrate, and automatize knowledge. As a man develops, the quantity of programmed data in his brain grows immeasurably expanding the range and efficacy of his mind. Cognitions, evaluations, physical skills, all are programmed and automatized in the course of normal human development. It is this programming, retained on the subconscious level, that makes possible man's continued intellectual growth. It also makes possible the instantaneous cognitive, emotional, and physical reactions without which he could not survive. When a man's mind is an act of focus, the goal or purpose he has set determines what material will be fed to him from the subconscious. If, for instance, a man is thinking about a problem in physics, then it is the material relevant to that particular problem that will normally flow into his conscious mind. The subconscious is regulated not only by the orders it receives in any immediate moment, but by the standing orders it has received, that is, by a man's long-term interests, values, and concerns. These affect how material is retained and classified, under which conditions it is reactivated, and what kind of subconscious connections are formed in response to new stimuli or data. Repression entails an automatized standing order forbidding integration. The simplest type of repression is the blocking from conscious awareness of painful or frightening memories. In this case, some event that was painful or frightening when it occurred and would be painful or frightening if recalled is inhibited from entering conscious awareness. Memory, like awareness, is necessarily selective. One normally remembers that to which one attaches importance. But in cases of repression, memories do not simply fade away. They are actively blocked. Consider the following example. A 12-year-old boy succumbs to the temptation to steal money from a friend's locker in school. Afterward, the boy is fearful that he will be found out. He feels humiliated and guilty. Time passes, and his act is not discovered. But whenever the memory of his theft comes back to him, he re-experiences the painful humiliation and guilt. He strives to banish the memory. He hastily turns his attention elsewhere, telling himself in effect, I don't want to remember I wish it would go away and leave me alone. And after a while, it does. He no longer has to eject the memory from conscious awareness. It is inhibited from entering. It is repressed. The act of banishing the memory has become automatized. Should the memory ever begin to float toward the surface of awareness, it is blocked before it can reach him. A kind of psychological alarm signal is set off, and the memory is again submerged. Twenty years later, he may encounter the friend from whom he stole the money and greet him cheerfully. He remembers nothing of his crime. Or he may feel vaguely uncomfortable in his friend's presence, but with no idea of the reason. Thoughts and evaluations, like memories, may be barred from awareness because of the pain they would invoke. Consider the case of a neurotically dependent woman who is married to a cruel, tyrannical man. She dares not let any criticism of him enter her awareness because she has surrendered her life to him. The thought that her owner and master is irrational and malevolent would be terrifying to her. She observes his behavior, her mind kept carefully empty, her judgment suspended. She has automatized a standing order forbidding evaluation. Somewhere within her is the knowledge of how she would judge her husband's behavior if it were exhibited by any other man. But this knowledge is not allowed to be integrated with the behavior she is observing in her husband. She has programmed herself, in effect, to be blind. If a man is to avoid repression, he must be prepared to face any thought and any emotion, 
and consider them rationally, secure in the conviction that he will not act without knowing what he is doing or why. Ignorance is not bliss, not in any area of man's life and certainly not with regard to the contents of his own mind. Repressed material does not cease to exist. It is merely driven underground to affect a man in ways he does not know, causing reactions he is helpless to account for, and sometimes exploding into neurotic symptoms. Now, there are occasions in a man's life when it is necessary for him to suppress thoughts and feelings. But suppression and repression are different processes. Suppression is a conscious, deliberate, non-evasive expelling of certain thoughts or feelings from focal awareness in order to turn one's attention elsewhere. Suppression does not involve a denial of any facts or a pretense that they do not exist. It involves the implicit premise that one will focus on the suppressed material later when appropriate. Sometimes, undeniably, there is a danger in suppression. A man may suppress thoughts or feelings when there are still unresolved conflicts involved that require further attention and analysis. He may do so with no intent of dishonesty, but a suppression that is repeated consistently can turn into repression. In effect, the suppression becomes automatized. When a person represses, his intention is to gain an increased sense of control over his life. Invariably, Inevitably, he achieves the opposite. Facts cannot be wiped out by self-made blindness. The person who attempts it merely succeeds in sabotaging his own consciousness. Repression devastates more than a man's emotions. It has disastrous effects on the clarity and efficiency of his thinking. When a man tries to consider any problem in an area touched by his repression, he finds that his mind tends to be unwieldy and his thinking distorted. His mind is straitjacketed. It is not free to consider all possibly relevant facts. As a consequence, he feels helpless to arrive at conclusions, or the conclusions he reaches are unreliable. This does not mean that once a man has repressed certain thoughts or feelings, he is permanently incapacitated. With sustained effort, it is possible for him to derepress. The details of the process of derepression are outside the scope of this discussion. It must be noted, however, that the process can be extremely challenging. In order to avoid repression, or in order to derepress, it is imperative that a man adopt a policy of becoming aware of his emotions, of paying attention to his emotions, that he take note of and conceptualize his emotional reactions, and that he identify their reasons. If his emotions are to be a source of pleasure to man, not a source of pain, he must learn to think about them. Pay attention to them. Be aware of them. Bring his consciousness to bear on them. Rational awareness is not the cold hand that kills. It is the power that liberates. This is an issue I discuss in great detail in a later book of mine called The Art of Living Consciously. One of the prime tasks of the science of psychology is to provide definitions of mental health and mental illness. Different psychologists and psychiatrists have proposed a variety of criteria for judging mental health. The mentally healthy person is said, for example, to have an unobstructed capacity for growth, development, and self-actualization, to have a firm sense of identity, to have insight into his own motivation, to have a high tolerance for stress, to be self-accepting, to be unencumbered by paralyzing conflicts, to have an integrated personality, and so on. Such descriptions may be valid, in fact they have a good deal to recommend them, but they are not definitions of mental health, and their precise meaning is not always clear. What must be provided is a fundamental principle, an identification of the essence of mental health. Such characteristics as the foregoing are effects or consequences, but what is their cause? My answer is as follows. Just as medical science evaluates a man's body by the standard of whether or not his body is functioning as man's life requires, so the science of psychology must employ the same standard in appraising the health or disease of a man's mind. The health of a man's mind must be judged by how well that mind performs its biological function. What is the biological function of mind? 
cognition, evaluation, and the regulation of action. The basic function of man's consciousness is cognition, that is, awareness and knowledge of the facts of reality. Since man must act, his survival requires that he apprehend reality so that he may regulate his behavior accordingly. The crucial link between cognition and the regulation of action is evaluation. Evaluation is the process of identifying the beneficial or harmful relationship of some aspect of reality to oneself. Evaluations underlie and generate desires, emotions, and goals. Now, if a man's values and goals are in conflict with the facts of reality and with his own needs as a living organism, then he unwittingly moves toward self-destruction. Thus, man's survival requires that his values and goals be chosen in the full context of his rational knowledge and understanding. Man is not infallible, and mental health does not require never making an error of knowledge or judgment. The concept of mental health pertains to the method by which a mind functions. It pertains to the principle by which a mind operates in dealing with the material of reality. It pertains to a man's psychoepistemology. The concept of psychoepistemology is crucially important, not only to the problem of mental health, but to the entire subject matter of this program. Let us therefore consider the meaning of this concept. The term psychoepistemology was first used in print in 1961 by Ayn Rand to designate a man's, quote, method of awareness, unquote. However, the concept of psychoepistemology, as used here, was originated neither by Ayn Rand nor by myself, but by Barbara Brandon, who, in the mid-1950s, first brought this field of study to our attention and persuaded us of its importance. As a field of scientific study, psychoepistemology should be classified as a branch of psychology. It may be described as the psychology of thinking or of cognition. Epistemology, of course, is a branch of philosophy. It is the science that studies the nature and means of human knowledge. Its basic concern is with the relationship of ideas to reality, not with mental processes as such. The study of mental processes as such is the province of psychology, most particularly of what I now call psychoepistemology. The concept of psychoepistemology is introduced in order to designate the study of mental operations on the conscious and subconscious levels of man's mind. The subject is an extremely broad one and involves many issues that are beyond the scope of this discussion. So, I shall confine myself to those essentials which have a direct bearing on the question of mental health. Mental processes may be conscious or subconscious and volitional or automatic. In any act of thinking, there is constant interaction between conscious volitional operations and subconscious automatic ones. Psychoepistemology is the study of the nature of and the relationship between the conscious, goal-setting, self-regulatory operations of the mind and the subconscious automatic operations. Man, we have seen, is a self-programmer whose conclusions, values, and standing orders direct the automatic integrative mechanism of his subconscious. As a person develops, he acquires a characteristic manner of cognitive functioning, a characteristic method of dealing with problems, thinking about issues, processing the data of reality. He may acquire the habit of seeking the highest possible level of mental clarity with regard to any issue he is considering, or he may come to accept as normal some level of unclarity or confusion. He may adopt the policy of always seeking to understand issues in terms of principles, or he may attempt to deal with problems in terms of the concretes of a given situation with no effort to relate his observations to wider abstractions. His thinking may be flexible, or it may be rigid. He may learn to differentiate clearly between his thinking and his emotions, or he may tend to treat his emotions as tools of cognition. The mental habits a person acquires and the standing orders he establishes constitute his characteristic psychoepistemology, his self-program method of mental functioning. A person's characteristic psychoepistemology may or may not be appropriate to the task of apprehending reality, or may be appropriate to a greater or lesser degree. A man is mentally healthy 
to the extent that his psychoepistemological processes are controlled by and fulfill the requirements of cognition, that is, of awareness of and contact with reality. A man is mentally unhealthy to the extent that his psychoepistemological processes are incompatible with the requirements of cognition and subvert his cognitive efficacy. Mental illness, then, is fundamentally psychoepistemological. A mental disorder is a thinking disorder. This is fairly obvious in cases where the patient's predominant symptoms are hallucinations, delusions, time-space disorientations, and so on. But it is equally true in cases where the patient's symptoms are less obviously cognitive in origin. This includes such things as pathological anxiety, depression, hypogondriasis, conversion reactions, or sadomasochism. Neurotic and psychotic manifestations, such as inappropriate emotional responses or aberrant behavior, are the symptoms and consequences of a mind's malfunctioning. But the root problem is always the mind's alienation from reality in some form to a greater or lesser extent. Consider, for example, a case of pathological depression. A secretary is asked by her employer to make certain that she finishes some office reports by the end of the day. She hears this request as a declaration of her incompetence and worthlessness, and she collapses in acute depression. It is misleading to say that she suffers from an emotional disorder. She suffers from a psychoepistemological disorder. Her problem lies in the mental processes by which she interprets the things she perceives and hears. Her problem lies in the mental processes generating her emotions. Once such disturbed emotions are generated, they tend to have a negative effect on the person's thinking, which then leads to further disturbed emotions and so on. This is one of the ways in which harmful psychoepistemological policies are self-reinforcing and self-perpetuating. But disturbed emotions do not create the initial problem. The initial problem creates the disturbed emotions. The same principle applies to behavior. If a man is dishonest, parasitical, and exploitative in his human relations, it is not his behavior that constitutes his mental illness, but the psychoepistemological policies behind his behavior. It should be noted that mental illness is not indicated by a man's momentary loss of cognitive contact with reality, such as might occur under the impact of a violent emotion. Mental illness implies the presence of enduring obstructions to a mind's cognitive efficacy. Mental illness implies the presence of automatized or partially automatized obstructions to conceptual integration, which in simpler language means to clear awareness. Mental health is unobstructed cognitive efficacy. Unobstructed cognitive efficacy requires and entails intellectual independence. A doctrine that is subversive of intellectual independence is subversive of mental health. Now, closely related to the concept of mental health is that of psychological maturity. Maturity, in the broadest sense, is the state of being fully grown or developed. A living organism is mature when its normal process of development is completed and it functions on the adult level appropriate to its species. Psychological maturity, then, is a concept pertaining to the successful development of man's consciousness. At first, a child knows only perceptual concretes. He does not know abstractions or principles. His world is only the immediate now. He cannot think, plan, or act long range. As the child grows, his intellectual field widens. He learns language, he begins to grasp abstractions, he generalizes, he makes increasingly subtle discriminations, he looks for principles. He rises from the sensory perceptual level of consciousness to the conceptual level. The basic index of successfully achieved adulthood is the policy of conceptualizing. All other aspects of psychological maturity are derivatives and consequences of developing one's conceptual faculty. There is an aspect of psychological maturity that is profoundly important and that few adults fully achieve. It pertains to one's attitude toward the unknown, not toward knowledge which has not yet been discovered by anyone, 
but toward knowledge which is available, but which one does not possess. To a child, the world around him is an immense unknown. He is aware that adults possess knowledge far in excess of his own, and that there are many things he is not yet able to understand. He tells himself, in effect, I will have to wait until I grow up. There are many things I cannot understand now. They are known to other people, but they are beyond me at present. This is not the attitude of a genuinely mature adult. An adult, too, of course, may recognize that there are things he does not yet know and needs to learn. But he does not entertain such a category as that which is known to others, but unknowable to him, meaning unknowable in principle. This does not mean that his goal is to possess encyclopedic knowledge. It means rather that within the sphere of his first-hand concerns, of his own actions and goals, he regards himself as competent to know that which he needs to know, and to acquire whatever knowledge his interests and purposes demand. It means that he does not resign himself to the permanently unknown, when and if the knowledge is available and is relevant to his activities. It means that he does not regard himself as a second-class citizen psychoepistemologically. It is this attitude, consistently maintained, that marks a man's entry into full adulthood, that is, into full self-responsibility. There is no value judgment more important to man, no factor more decisive in his psychological development and motivation than the estimate he passes on himself. This estimate is ordinarily experienced by him, not in the form of a conscious, verbalized judgment, but in the form of a feeling that can be hard to isolate and identify because he experiences it constantly. It is part of every other feeling. It is involved in his every emotional response. The nature of his self-evaluation has profound effects on a man's thinking processes, emotions, desires, values, and goals. It is the single most significant key to his behavior. To understand a man psychologically, one must understand the nature and degree of his self-esteem and the standards by which he judges himself. Man experiences his desire for self-esteem as an urgent imperative, as a basic need. Whether he identifies the issue explicitly or not, he cannot escape the feeling that his estimate of himself is of life and death importance. At three o'clock in the morning, at some level, that is a fact we are all aware of. So intensely does a man feel the need of a positive view of himself, that he may evade, repress, distort his judgment, disintegrate his mind. This in order to avoid coming face to face with facts that would affect his self-appraisal adversely. A man who has chosen or accepted irrational standards by which to judge himself can be driven all his life to pursue flagrantly self-destructive goals. This in order to assure himself that he possesses a self-esteem which in fact he does not have. If and to the extent that men lack self-esteem, they feel driven to fake it, to create the illusion of self-esteem. Thus they condemn themselves to chronic psychological fraud. Self-esteem has two interrelated aspects or components. It entails a sense of personal efficacy and a sense of personal worth. It is the integrated sum of self-confidence and self-respect. It is the conviction that one is competent to live and worthy of living. Man's need of self-esteem is inherent in his nature, but he is not born with the knowledge of what will satisfy that need or of the standard by which self-esteem is to be gauged. He must discover it. Here is where our earlier discussion of needs becomes relevant. Why does man need self-esteem? How does it relate to his survival? What are the conditions of its attainment? What is the cause of its profound motivational power? These are the questions we must consider. There are two facts about man's nature which hold the key to the answer. The first is the fact that reason is man's basic means of survival. The second is the fact that the exercise of his rational faculty is volitional. 
Most men do not identify the role and importance of reason in their lives. But from the time that the child acquires the capacity of conceptual functioning, he becomes increasingly aware, implicitly and subverbally, of his responsibility for regulating his mind's activity. He acquires the ability to discriminate between the state of mental focus and the state of mental fog, and to choose one state or the other. Now, let us consider the relevance of these facts to man's need of self-esteem. Since man must choose his goals and actions, his life and happiness require that he be right, right in the conclusions he draws and the choices he makes. But he cannot demand or expect omniscience or infallibility. What he needs is the conviction that his method of choosing and of making decisions, his characteristic manner of using his consciousness, is right in principle, appropriate to reality. Man is the only living species able to reject, sabotage, and betray his own means of survival, his mind. He is the only living species who must make himself competent to live by the proper exercise of his rational faculty. How a man chooses to deal with this issue is, psychologically, the most significant fact about him because it lies at the very core of his being as a biological entity. To the extent that a man is committed to cognition, to the extent that the primary goal regulating the functioning of his consciousness is awareness, the mental operations activated by his choice lead in the direction of cognitive efficacy. To the extent that he fails or refuses to make awareness the regulating goal of his consciousness, to the extent that he evades the effort of thought and the responsibility of reason, the result is cognitive inefficacy. To think or not to think, to focus his mind or to suspend it, is man's basic act of choice, the one act directly within his volitional power. To the extent that man characteristically makes the right choices, he experiences a sense of control over his existence the control of a mind in proper relationship to reality. Self-confidence is confidence in one's mind in its reliability as a tool of cognition. Such confidence is not the conviction that one can never make an error. This point must be emphasized. Rather, it is the conviction that one is competent to think, to judge, to know, that one is competent in principle. It is the conviction that one is committed to being in unbreached contact with reality to the fullest extent of one's power. It is the confidence of knowing that one places no value or consideration higher than reality. This basic type of confidence must be distinguished from other more superficial types of self-confidence, which reflect a person's sense of efficacy at particular tasks or in particular areas. This basic self-confidence is not a judgment passed on one's knowledge or special skills. It is a judgment passed on that which acquires knowledge and skills. It is psychoepistemological self-confidence. It is a judgment passed on one's characteristic manner of facing and dealing with the facts of reality. Man needs such self-confidence because to doubt the efficacy of his tool of survival is to be stopped, paralyzed, condemned to anxiety and helplessness, and to some extent, rendered unfit to live. Very early in his development, as a child becomes aware of his power to choose his actions, as he acquires the sense of being a person, he experiences the need to feel that he is right as a person, right in his characteristic manner of acting. He needs to feel that he is good. He is not aware of the question in relation to the issue of life or death. He is aware of it only in relation to the alternative of joy or suffering. To be right as a person is to be fit for happiness. To be wrong is to be threatened by pain. As I have stressed, no other living species faces such questions as, What kind of entity should I seek to become? By what moral principles should I guide my life? But there is no way for a man to escape these questions. Man cannot exempt himself from the realm of values and value judgments. Whether the values by which he judges himself are conscious 
or subconscious, rational or irrational, consistent or contradictory, life-serving or life-negating. Every human being judges himself by some standard. And to the extent that he fails to satisfy that standard, his sense of personal worth, his self-respect, suffers accordingly. Man needs self-respect because he has to act to achieve values, and in order to act, he needs to value the beneficiary of his action. In order to seek values, man must consider himself worthy of enjoying them. In order to fight for his happiness, he must consider himself worthy of happiness. The two aspects of self-esteem, self-confidence, and self-respect can be isolated conceptually, but they are inseparable in a man's psychology. Man makes himself worthy of living by making himself competent to live, by dedicating his mind to the task of discovering what is true and what is right, and by governing his actions accordingly. If a man defaults on the responsibility of thought and reason, thus undercutting his competence to live, he will not retain his sense of worthiness. If he betrays his moral convictions, thus undercutting his sense of worthiness, he will not retain his sense of competence. The root of both aspects of self-esteem is psychoepistemological. Such, in briefest essence, are the nature and causes of man's need of self-esteem. If man is to achieve and maintain self-esteem, the first and fundamental requirement is that he preserve an indomitable will to understand. The desire for comprehension of that which falls within the range of his awareness is the guardian of man's mental health and the motor of his intellectual growth. The potential range of a man's awareness depends on the extent of his intelligence, but the principle of the will to understand remains the same on all levels of intelligence. It requires the identification and integration to the best of a man's knowledge and ability of that which comes into his mental field. Unfortunately, this attitude is usually relinquished or breached very early in a person's life. Then the person adjusts to the sense of living in an unintelligible, bewildering, and frightening universe in which cognitive self-confidence is impossible. Sometimes the cause is a volitional default on the part of the child, an attitude of irresponsible passivity and dependence. Sometimes the cause is the child's desire to indulge in wishes or actions he knows to be irrational, which requires that a policy of evasion be instituted, which requires that the will to understand be suspended. However, often the causes are much more complex. Take, for instance, the case of a child who comes up against human irrationality with which he does not know how to cope. A child may find the world around him, the world of his parents and other adults, incomprehensible and threatening. Many of the actions, emotions, ideas, expectations, and demands of the adults appear senseless, contradictory, oppressive, and bewilderingly inimical to him. After a number of unsuccessful attempts to understand their policies and behavior, the child gives up, and, here is the tragedy, takes the blame for his feeling of helplessness. He may react with anger or hostility or anxiety or depression or withdrawal, but, consciously or subconsciously, he takes his failure to understand as a reflection on himself. He concludes that there is something wrong with him, that he is intellectually or morally deficient in some nameless way. Gradually, he gives up the expectation that he will ever be able to make sense of the world around him. He resigns himself to living with the permanently unknowable. A child is vulnerable because he is not yet able to recognize clearly and unequivocally that his elders are irrational. He cannot grasp their motives. He knows they know more than he does, but he senses that there is something terribly wrong with them or with himself or with something. What he feels is, I'll never understand people. I'll never be able to do what they expect of me. I don't know what's right or wrong, and I'm never going to know. So long as a child continues to struggle, so long as he does not give up the will to understand, he is psychologically safe, no matter what his anguish or bewilderment. Because in that case, 
he keeps his mind and his desire for efficacy intact. When he surrenders the expectation of achieving efficacy, he surrenders the possibility of achieving full self-esteem. Every child realizes that there are things he cannot expect to know until he grows older. That is not his problem. The problem lies in the things he feels he will never know, yet needs to know, if he is to function successfully. This makes him regard himself, in effect, as an outcast in that foreign land called reality. Man controls his mind's activity and growth by the goals he sets, in effect, by the assignments he gives to his consciousness. If he holds to the will to understand, he thereby activates a process of growth and development which continually raises his mind's power. If he abandons the will to understand, his mind reacts accordingly. It does not continue to rise to higher levels of cognitive efficiency. This, then, is the basic condition necessary for the achievement of self-esteem, the preservation of the will to understand in every aspect of one's life. Now let us consider another condition necessary for the achievement of self-esteem. In the course of a human being's development, he encounters a problem which, according to how he chooses to deal with it, has profound repercussions on his self-esteem. First encountered in childhood, it is a problem that every person faces on some occasions in his life. There are times when a man's mind and emotions are not perfectly synchronized. He experiences desires or fears that clash with his rational understanding, and he must choose to follow either his rational understanding or his emotions. One of the most important things a child must learn is that emotions are not adequate guides to action. The fact that he desires to perform some action is not proof that he should perform it. The fact that he fears to perform some action is not proof that he should avoid performing it. Emotions are not tools of cognition nor criteria of judgment. The ability to distinguish between knowledge and feelings is an essential element in the process of a mind's healthy maturation. It is vital for the achievement and preservation of self-esteem. Self-esteem requires and entails what I call cognitive self-assertiveness, which is expressed through the policy of thinking, judging, and governing action accordingly. To sacrifice one's mind in favor of feelings one cannot justify or defend is to subvert one's self-esteem. If a man permits himself to be carried along passively by feelings he does not judge, he loses the sense of control over his existence that is essential to self-esteem. A child at first is not aware of such a dichotomy as valid desires versus invalid desires. He comes to learn from his experiences and from the teachings of his parents that some of the things he desires are good for him and others are not. Later he learns another subtler distinction. He is entitled to some of the things that he desires but not to others. Thus he comes to learn that the validity of his desires must be judged. Consider the case of a child who is tempted to steal the toy of a friend. He hesitates because he knows that he has no right to the toy, and that he would be indignant if his friend were to steal one of his toys. But he wants this particular toy, so he evades his knowledge and commits the theft. Within a few months he forgets about the incident, but its consequences are not ended. Wordlessly registered in his mind is the principle that it is permissible at times to ignore knowledge and facts in order to indulge a desire. This is the legacy of his theft. This, plus a residue of vague, nameless guilt, the sense of some inner uncleanliness, the state of a mind learning to distrust itself. He is free subsequently to repudiate this principle consciously and expunge it from his psychology. But if he fails to do so, if instead he reinforces it by repeated acts of evasion and irrational emotional indulgence, he undermines his self-esteem still further. How badly his self-esteem is damaged will depend on the frequency of his evasions, the extent of the knowledge he evades, and the nature of the desires he indulges. Some offenses are clearly more serious than others. If a person develops healthily, mind and emotions tend to achieve harmony. He is not chronically torn by conflicts between his desires and his knowledge. But no matter how well integrated a person may be, 
The process of holding and integrating the full long-range context of his knowledge is not automatic or infallible. Thus, a man always has the responsibility of monitoring and appraising his desires. The majority of men as adults suffer from a significant deficit of self-esteem. The senseless tragedy of their lives is that most of them betrayed their mind not for the sake of gratifying some violent, if irrational, passion, but for the sake of indulging meaningless or senseless whims that they can no longer remember. They betrayed their minds for the sake of being free to act on the impulse or spur of the moment without the responsibility of awareness or thought. They betrayed their minds more often than not over trivia. If it is psychologically disastrous to reject one's mind under the pressure of irrational desires, there is another practice which is perhaps more disastrous still, and that is rejecting one's mind under the pressure of fear. The sacrifice of one's mind to fear is a form of self-abnegation. Now, of course, the experience of fear per se is not abnormal or pathological. In many instances, fear has a definite value. It can activate man to cope with some danger. What is crucial for man's psychological well-being is his attitude toward fear, his method of dealing with it. For instance, it is very common for young children to have the experience of being frightened by a barking dog but children can react to this experience in different ways. One child may be careful to avoid the dog as a practical precautionary measure. Later, he may learn that the dog is not harmful but playful and may make himself approach the dog and pat him until all fear is gone. Another child may avoid the dog after the first encounter, but continue to whimper and whine whenever he sees or hears the dog, even at a great distance. No amount of evidence that the dog is friendly alters his attitude. The difference in their reactions reflects the different attitudes they adopt toward their fear. The first child, even though afraid, remains in cognitive control. He does not permit the fear to overwhelm his consciousness. Consequently, he does not regard the fear and his avoidance of the dog as a reflection on himself or on his personal worth. He is able to grasp, when the evidence presents itself, that the dog is not in fact a danger to him and his policy toward the dog changes accordingly. But the second child, overwhelmed by fear, his self-awareness is reduced to a sense of all-encompassing helplessness. Nothing is real to him, nothing matters, except that he is afraid. That is why his mind is not open to evidence that could change his policy toward the dog. In the life of a young child, a certain amount of fear is to be expected. Normally and healthily, with the growth of his knowledge and abilities, these fears are overcome and left behind, so that, with the transition to adulthood, fewer and fewer things have the power to invoke fear in him. The extent to which a child follows this course to full maturity depends on the policy he adopts for dealing with his fears. If, in such situations, a child struggles to preserve the clarity of his mind, he will find, as he grows older, that his susceptibility to fear diminishes radically. If, however, he characteristically surrenders to fear, then fear gains a greater and greater power over him, and each subsequent surrender feels more and more inevitable. His sense of personal efficacy is affected accordingly. The same principle applies on an adult level. For example, a man may remain silent and passively unprotesting when things which he values are being attacked through fear of not belonging or not being accepted. Or a man may retreat from the challenges of life and bury himself in the safety of the familiar through fear of failure or of making mistakes. Or a woman may repress her desire for a career through a fear of being considered unfeminine. In all, the result is a profound sense of humiliation, of self-abasement, of self-renunciation, which means a profound loss of self-esteem. Sometimes, of course, a fear experience can be so intense that the capacity for thought is momentarily wiped out. But such panic reactions pertain to short-term emergency situations and are, by their very nature, short-lived. In such cases, a person's attitude and policy toward fear is manifested through what he does when the panic dies down. Does he then proceed to think about the experience, to assimilate it, and to prepare himself for future similar situations? In other words, 
does he seek to reassert mastery and control over his life? Or does he merely shudder at the memory of the fear, struggle to evade the issue, and hope he will not encounter such problems again, resigning himself to a feeling of helplessness? The policy a man adopts in dealing with fear depends on whether he preserves what I call the will to efficacy. It depends on whether he preserves the value of self-confidence as a goal not to be relinquished, and consequently regards a state of fear as temporary and abnormal and as that which he must overcome. Or does he resign himself to a sense of impotence and accept fear as a basic, unalterable given of his existence, to be endured, not defeated? Just as the will to understand requires that man never resign himself to accepting the unknowable as an inherent part of his life, so the will to efficacy requires that he never resign himself to living with uncontested fear. It must be stressed that the concept of surrender to fear pertains to a psychoepistemological process. That process is the subversion of one's consciousness in order to avoid or minimize a fear experience. This practice is entirely different from the rational avoidance of real dangers. In fact, opposite principles are at work in these two cases. In the first case, one is fleeing from reality. In the second, one is taking proper cognizance of it. The policies by which a man determines the state of his self-esteem are formed gradually across time. They are not the product of the choices of a single moment or issue. The collapse of self-esteem is not reached in a day, a week, or a month. It is the cumulative result of a long succession of defaults, evasions, and irrationalities, a long succession of failures to use one's mind properly. Self-esteem or the lack of it is the reputation a man acquires with himself. In the process of his psychological growth and development, a human being creates his own character. He does not do so self-consciously or by explicit intention. He does so by means of the volitional choices he makes day by day. A child does not commit himself to the will to understand in explicit terms. But in issue after issue that falls within the range of his awareness, he strives to achieve the fullest clarity and intelligibility possible to him, and thus he acquires a mental habit, a policy of dealing with reality, which can be identified conceptually as the will to understand. It is a policy that he must reaffirm volitionally in each new issue he encounters for as long as he lives. It always remains a matter of choice. The choices a human being makes with regard to the operation of his consciousness do not vanish leaving no trace behind them. These choices have long-term psychological consequences. The way a man chooses to deal with reality registers in his mind for good or for bad. Either it confirms and strengthens his self-esteem, or it undermines and depletes it. The concept of self-esteem must be distinguished from the concept of pride. The two are related, but there are significant differences in their meaning. Self-esteem pertains to a man's conviction of his fundamental efficacy and worth. Pride pertains to the pleasure a man takes in himself on the basis of, and in response to, specific achievements or actions. Self-esteem is confidence in one's capacity to achieve values. Pride is the consequence of having achieved some particular value or values. Self-esteem is, I can. Pride is, I have. The deepest pride a man can experience is that which results from his achievement of self-esteem. Since self-esteem is a value that has to be earned, the man who does so feels proud of his attainment. If, in spite of his best efforts, a man fails in a particular undertaking, he does not experience the same emotion of pride that he would feel if he had succeeded. But, if he is rational, his self-esteem is unaffected and unimpaired. His self-esteem is not, or should not be, dependent on particular successes or failures, since these are not necessarily in a man's direct or exclusive control. The failure to understand this principle causes an incalculable amount of unnecessary anguish and self-doubt. 
If a man judges himself by criteria that entail factors outside his control, the result is a precarious self-esteem that is in chronic jeopardy. For example, a man may find himself in a situation where it would be highly desirable for him to possess certain knowledge, but he does not possess it. This is not because of evasion or irresponsibility, but because he had seen no reason to acquire it, or had not known how to acquire it, or because the means to acquire it were not available to him. Now in reason, such a man has no grounds to reproach himself for inadequacy, yet he does so telling himself that somehow he should know the things he does not know, and his self-esteem suffers accordingly. One of the worst wrongs a man can do to himself is to accept an unearned guilt on the premise of a somehow. Somehow I should know. Somehow I should be able to do it. This, when there is no cognitive content to that somehow, only an empty, undefined charge supported by nothing. There is one reason in particular why many men are susceptible to this error. Although a man may be blameless in the present situation, previous irrationalities and failures to think may have led to a general sense of self-distrust, so that he never feels fully certain of his moral status. The solution to this problem lies in recognizing this form of uncertainty for what it is, identifying it as a symptom and striving to be objective and factual in one's self-appraisal. The struggle to achieve a rational policy in dealing with guilt will in itself contribute to the regaining or strengthening of self-esteem. In analyzing the psychology of self-esteem, one of the most important aspects to consider is the relationship of self-esteem to productive work, and more broadly, to the growth and exercise of a man's mental abilities. When I discussed earlier the concept of efficacy, I was speaking of what might be called metaphysical efficacy. This is the kind of efficacy which pertains to a man's basic relationship to reality and reflects the reality-oriented nature of his thinking processes. But there is another sense in which the concept of efficacy may be used. It may refer to a man's effectiveness in specific areas of endeavor, resulting from particular knowledge and skills he has acquired. I shall designate this latter type as particularized efficacy. The kinds of particularized efficacy men acquire, the specific skills they attain, vary according to their interests, values, context, and knowledge. By contrast, metaphysical efficacy is not confined to any particular form of activity. It is applicable to every form of rational endeavor. Self-esteem is not a value which, once achieved, is maintained effortlessly and automatically thereafter. As in the case of every value of a living organism, action is necessary not only to gain it, but also to keep it. Just as the breathing a man does today will not keep him alive tomorrow, so the thinking a man does today will not preserve his self-esteem tomorrow. If he then chooses to evade, to stagnate mentally, to arrest and subvert his rational faculty. Man maintains his metaphysical efficacy by continuing to expand his particularized efficacy throughout his life. That is, by continuing to expand his knowledge, understanding, and ability. Continual intellectual growth is a necessity of self-esteem as it is a necessity of man's life. When man discovered how to make fire to keep himself warm, his need of thought and effort was not ended. When he discovered how to fashion a bow and arrow, his need of thought and effort was not ended. When he discovered how to build a shelter out of stone, then out of brick, then out of glass and steel, his need of thought and effort was not ended. When he moved his life expectancy from nineteen to thirty to forty to sixty to seventy, his need of thought and effort was not ended. So long as he lives, his need of thought and effort is never ended. The desire to grow in knowledge and skills, in understanding and control, is the expression of a man's commitment to the life process and to the state of being human. If and when a man decides that, in effect, he has thought enough, that no further learning is necessary, that he has nowhere to go and nothing to achieve, then he has decided, 
in fact, whether he recognizes it or not, that he has lived enough. Stagnant passivity and self-esteem are incompatible. The foregoing should not be taken to mean that for the psychologically healthy man, life consists exclusively of problem-solving, productive work, and the pursuit of long-range goals. No. Leisure, recreation, love, and human companionship are vital elements in human existence. But productive work is the process through which a man achieves that sense of control over his life which is the precondition of his being able fully to enjoy the other values possible to him. The man whose life lacks direction or purpose, the man who has no productive aim, necessarily feels helpless and out of control. The man who feels helpless and out of control feels inadequate to and unfit for existence. And the man who feels unfit for existence is incapable of enjoying it. A productive purpose is a psychological need. To live purposefully and productively is a requirement of psychological well-being. The earliest self-generated pleasure of a human being's life is the pleasure of gaining a sense of control, a sense of efficacy. As the child learns to move his body, to crawl, to bang a spoon against a table and produce a sound, to build a structure of blocks, the enjoyment he exhibits is that of a living being gaining power over its own existence. It is this form of pleasure that a psychologically healthy person never loses. It remains a central motive of his life. This attitude accounts for the phenomenon of the mentally active man who is young at 90, just as the absence of this attitude accounts for the phenomenon of the mentally passive man who is old at 30. Perhaps this is the place to remind you of what I said in the introduction, namely, that I use the term man here in the generic sense to apply equally to men and women. None of these observations are intended to apply exclusively to the male gender. The higher the level of a man's self-esteem, the higher the goals he sets for himself and the more demanding the challenges he tends to seek. On any level of intelligence or ability, one of the characteristics of self-esteem is a man's eagerness for the new and the challenging, for that which will allow him to use his capacities to the fullest extent. In the same way, a fondness for the familiar, the routine, the unexacting, and a fear of the new and the difficult is almost certainly an indication of a self-esteem deficiency. It must be emphasized that productive achievement is a consequence and an expression of healthy self-esteem, not its cause. The cause of authentic self-esteem is psychoepistemological, the rational, reality-directed character of a person's thinking processes. The causal sequence is as follows. A rational psychoepistemology leads to the attainment of self-esteem. The two together lead to achievements. Achievements lead to pride. Failing to understand this causal sequence, many men make the disastrous error of attempting to base their self-esteem on how well they succeed in achieving particular productive goals. However, success of this kind is not necessarily in a man's direct or exclusive control. Since man is neither omniscient nor infallible, and since in many productive endeavors the participation of other people is involved, it is profoundly dangerous to a person's self-esteem to let his sense of personal worth depend on factors beyond his control. The possession of self-esteem does not provide a man with automatic immunity to errors that may have painful emotional consequences. Rationality does not guarantee infallibility. But a healthy self-esteem gives man a great weapon in dealing with errors. Since his own value and the efficacy of his mind are not in doubt, he is free to bring his full intellectual powers and knowledge to the task of identifying facts and dealing with problems. The foundation of his consciousness is secure, so to speak. Conversely, one of the most disastrous consequences of an impaired or deficient self-esteem is that it tends to hamper and undercut the efficiency of a person's thinking processes. It deprives him of the full strength and benefit of his own intelligence. There are many ways in which a deficiency in self-esteem can adversely affect a person's thinking processes. If a man who faces the basic problems of life with an attitude of, who am I to know? Who am I to decide? The man is undercut intellectually at the outset. A mind does not struggle for that which it regards as impossible. 
If a man feels that his thinking is doomed to failure, he doesn't think, or doesn't think very persistently. If a man sees himself as helpless, ineffectual, his actions will tend to confirm and reinforce his negative self-image, thus setting up a vicious circle. By the same principle, a man who is confident of his efficacy will tend to function efficaciously. A man's self-appraisal has profound motivational consequences for good or for bad. Its most immediate impact is felt in the quality and ambitiousness of his thinking. Many men become, in effect, the psychological prisoners of their own negative self-image. They define themselves as weak or mediocre or unmasculine or cowardly or ineffectual, and their subsequent performance is affected accordingly. The process by which this occurs is subconscious. Most men do not hold their self-image in conscious, conceptual form. While men are capable of acting contrary to their negative self-image, and many men do so at least on some occasions, the factor that tends to prevent them from breaking free is their attitude of resignation toward their own state. This is a particularly tragic error. When a person suffers from low self-esteem and institutes various irrational defenses to protect himself from the knowledge of his deficiency, he necessarily introduces distortions into his thinking. Consider, for example, the case of a man who, lacking authentic self-esteem, attempts to gain a sense of personal value from the image of himself as a big operator in business, a daring and shrewd go-getter who is just one deal away from a fortune. He keeps losing money in one get-rich-quick scheme after another. He is always blind to the evidence that his plans are impractical, always boasting extravagantly, his eyes on nothing but the hypnotically dazzling image of himself as a brilliantly skillful businessman. In order to protect a view of himself that the facts of reality cannot sustain, he severs cognitive contact with reality. He moves from one disaster to another, his sight turned inward, dreading to discover that the vision of himself, which feels like a life preserver, is in fact a noose choking him to death. There is no way to preserve the clarity of one's thinking so long as there are considerations in one's mind that take precedence over the facts of reality. For tense, Self-deception, role-playing, are so much a part of most men's lives that they have virtually lost, if they ever possessed, the knowledge of what it means to have an unreserved respect for the facts of reality. That is, what it means to take reality seriously. They spend most of their lives in a subjective world of their own neurotic creation, then wonder why they feel anxiety and helplessness in the real world. The misery, frustration, and terror that characterize the psychological state of most men testify to two facts. First, that self-esteem is a basic need without which man cannot live the life proper to him. And second, that self-esteem can be achieved only by the consistent exercise of the one faculty that permits man to apprehend reality, his reason. Since self-esteem is a fundamental need of man's consciousness, Men who fail to achieve self-esteem strive to fake it. They try to evade its lack and to seek protection from their state of inner dread behind the barricade of a pseudo-self-esteem. Let me explain what pseudo-self-esteem means. It is a non-rational, self-protective device to diminish anxiety and to provide a spurious sense of security, a device to assuage a need of authentic self-esteem while allowing the real causes of its lack to be evaded. A person's pseudo-self-esteem is maintained by two means, essentially. First, by evading, repressing, rationalizing, and otherwise denying ideas and feelings that could affect his self-appraisal adversely. And second, by seeking to derive his sense of efficacy and worth from something other than rationality, some alternative value or virtue which he experiences as less demanding or more easily attainable. This might include such things as doing one's duty or being financially successful or sexually attractive. This complex process of self-deception on which the neurotic builds so much of his life holds the key to his motivation, to his values, and his goals. To understand the nature and form of a particular man's pseudo-self-esteem is to understand the mainspring of his actions, to know, in effect, what makes him tick. In the psychology of a man of authentic self-value, there is no clash between his recognition of the facts of reality and the preservation of his self-esteem. 
This is because he bases his self-esteem on his determination to know and to act in accordance with the facts of reality as he understands them. But to the man of pseudo-self-esteem, reality appears as a threat. He feels in effect that it's reality or his self-esteem. This is why a man may be perfectly rational and lucid in an area that does not touch on or threaten his pseudo-self-esteem, and be flagrantly irrational, evasive, defensive, and even stupid in an area which is threatening to his self-appraisal. The process of evasion and repression is not sufficient to provide a neurotic with the illusion of self-esteem. That process is only part of the self-deception he perpetrates. The other part consists of the values he chooses as the means of achieving a sense of personal worth. In the process of choosing values, there is a fundamental difference in principle between the motivation of a man of self-esteem and a man of pseudo-self-esteem. An individual who develops healthily derives intense pleasure and pride from the work of his mind and from the achievements which that work makes possible. Feeling confident of his ability to deal with the facts of reality, he will want a challenging, effortful, creative existence. Feeling confident of his own value, he will be drawn to self-esteem in others. What he will desire most in human relationships is the opportunity to feel admiration. He will want to find persons and achievements he can respect that will give him the pleasure which his own character and achievements can offer others. In the sphere both of work and of human relationships, his base and motor is a firm sense of confidence, of efficacy, and as a consequence, a love for existence, for the fact of being alive. The base and motor of the man without self-esteem is not confidence, but fear. Not to live, but to escape his terror of life, is his fundamental goal. Not creativeness, but safety, is his ruling desire. And what he seeks from others is not the chance to experience admiration, but an escape from moral values, an escape from moral judgment, a promise to be forgiven, to be accepted, to be taken care of, to be comforted and protected in a terrifying universe. A man's self-esteem or pseudo-self-esteem determines his abstract values, not the specific goals he will seek. The latter proceed from a number of factors such as a person's intelligence, knowledge, premises, and personal context. For instance, a person of high self-esteem will desire intellectually challenging work, but whether he chooses to enter business or science or art depends on narrower, less fundamental considerations. Similarly, a man of pseudo-self-esteem will desire that others protect him from reality, but a variety of factors determine whether he feels more at home among the country club set or the academic set or the underworld set. The principle that distinguishes the basic motivation of a man of self-esteem from that of a man of pseudo-self-esteem is the principle of motivation by love versus motivation by fear. Love of self and of existence versus the fear that oneself is unfit for existence. Motivation by confidence versus motivation by terror. To the extent that a man lacks self-esteem, he lives negatively and defensively. When he chooses his particular values and goals, his primary motive is not to afford himself a positive enjoyment of existence, but to defend himself against anxiety, against painful feelings of inadequacy, self-doubt, and guilt. Values chosen in this manner may be termed defense values. A defense value is one motivated by fear and aimed at supporting a pseudo-self-esteem. It is experienced in effect as a means of survival, as a substitute for rationality. It is an anti-anxiety device. Such a value is unhealthy, not necessarily by virtue of its nature, but by virtue of the motivation for choosing it. The value itself may not be irrational. What is irrational is the reason for its selection. Productive work, for instance, is a rational value, but escaping into work as a means of evading one's shortcomings and conflicts is obviously not rational. A significant characteristic of defense values is the unreasoning compulsiveness with which they are usually held. Men of pseudo-self-esteem cling to these values with blind tenacity and fanatical devotion as they would cling to a life preserver in a stormy sea. Man's greatest fear is not of dying, but of feeling unfit to live. And to escape the agony of that feeling, men will pay any price. They will defy logic, they will sacrifice their practical self-interest, 
Sometimes they will even forfeit their life. With rare exceptions, they will pay any price except the one that could save them. They will not acknowledge the fraudulence of their defenses and work to achieve an authentic self-esteem. They will not accept the responsibility of living as rational beings. No evasion, no defense values, no strategy of self-deception can ever provide a man with a substitute for authentic self-esteem. The sense of efficacy and virtue men long for cannot be purchased by any of the self-frauds men perpetrate. Man needs the conviction that he is right for reality, right in principle, and only a policy of rationality can achieve it. The tragedy of most men's lives comes from their attempts to escape this fact. Self-esteem is the key to man's motivation by virtue either of its presence or of its absence. And perhaps the most eloquent testimony to the urgency of man's need for self-esteem is the terror that haunts the lives of those who fail to achieve it, the twisted paths along which that terror drives them, and the inevitable wreckage at the end. There is no object of fear more terrifying to man than fear itself, and no fear more terrifying than that for which he knows no object. Yet to live with such fear as a haunting constant of their existence is the fate of countless millions of men and women. It has been the fate of most of the human race. I do not speak of that fear which few men can escape, the fear of dictatorship, of war, of enslavement, of economic collapse, of arbitrary, unpredictable violence. Such fear can be natural and rational, a realistically appropriate response to concrete and tangible dangers. The fear of which I speak occurs without the existence of any apparent perils. Its unique characteristic is that it appears to be causeless. Its victims know only that they destruct them, but they do not know why. Project the kind of terror a man would feel while hanging by a frayed rope over an abyss. Then omit the rope and the abyss. Conceive of a person victimized by such an emotion, not while suspended precariously in space, but while safely at home in his living room or at his office. This is pathological anxiety in its acute stage. Pathological anxiety is a state of dread experienced in the absence of any actual or impending objectively perceivable threat. Pathological anxiety differs from the ordinary fears of everyday life. Ordinary fear is a proportionate and localized reaction to a concrete, external, and immediate danger such as fear of standing in the path of an oncoming car. It differs also from normal anxiety. Normal anxiety is a feeling of helplessness and apprehension directed like fear toward a specific source. But the danger is less immediate than in the case of fear, and the emotion is more anticipatory, such as the feeling that might overcome a person confronted with signs of some serious illness. Normal fear and anxiety vanish when the danger is removed. They are not, in effect, a personality attribute of their possessor. But pathological anxiety is. Pathological anxiety does not always appear in an intense or violent form. Many of its victims know it not as an acute attack of panic or as a chronic sense of dread, but only as an occasional uneasiness, a diffuse sense of nervousness and apprehension, coming and going unpredictably, pursuing some incomprehensible pattern of its own. It can exist on a continuum from faint discomfort to an experience of such agony that many who have known it have sworn they would sooner die than undergo it a second time. In cases of pathological anxiety, the sufferer can give no identity to that which he fears, for he feels afraid of nothing in particular and of everything in general. If he tries to offer some rationalized explanation for his feeling, if he grasps at some sign in the external world to prove he is in danger, his explanations are transparently illogical. He then acts as though that which he fears is not any specific concrete, but reality as such. The percentage of people in the world who suffer from an acute form of mental or emotional disturbance is high. Yet such persons constitute only a very small percentage of the total number of men and women who suffer from pathological anxiety throughout most of their lives, but whose disorder never reaches an alarming degree. These individuals would, in most cases, be regarded by those around them as quite normal. They would not themselves think of questioning their psychological health merely because they are prey to fits of inexplicable, objectless apprehension. These are the persons who, for instance, cannot bear to be alone, 
or they cannot live without sleeping pills, or drink too much, or they feel a constant need to be amusing and entertain, or flee to too many movies they have no desire to see, and to too many gatherings they have no desire to attend. Or, these persons are obsessively concerned with what others think of them. Or, they long to be emotional dependents, or to be dependent upon. Or, they succumb to periodic spells of unaccountable depression. Or, they run from one meaningless sexual affair to another. Or, they seek membership in a kind of collective movements that dissolve personal identity and obviate personal responsibility. A vast, anonymous assemblage of men and women who have accepted fear as a built-in, not-to-be-wondered-about fixture of their soul, dreading even to identify that what they feel is fear, or to inquire into the nature of that which they seek to escape. What is the nature and cause of pathological anxiety? To answer this question, one should begin by noting the metaphysical character of this anxiety. The fear seems to be directed at the universe at large existence as such, as though implying that to be is to be in mortal danger. The anxious person feels a profound sense of helplessness, of impotence. He feels a sense of shapeless but impending disaster, and often he feels a unique nameless sense of guilt, and the guilt too has a metaphysical quality. He feels wrong, wrong as a person, wrong in some fundamental way that is wider than any particular fault or defect he can identify. When a person suffers from this metaphysical kind of dread, the cause does not lie in the external world. It lies within himself. It is not something that reality has done to him. It is something he has done to himself. He carries the threat and the danger within his own consciousness. Pathological anxiety is nature's alarm signal, warning a man that he is in an improper psychological condition that his relationship to reality is wrong. It is his mind's cry of inefficacy and loss of control. It is a crisis of self-esteem. Whenever a man feels fear, any kind of fear, his response reflects an estimate of some danger to him, some threat to his values. The value being threatened in the case of pathological anxiety is the sufferer's ego. A person's ego is his mind his faculty of awareness, his ability to think. It is the faculty that perceives reality, preserves the inner continuity of his existence, and generates his sense of personal identity. Any threat to a person's ego, anything which he experiences as a danger to his mind's efficacy and control, is a potential source of pathological anxiety. The pain of this anxiety is the most terrible that man can know because the value at stake is necessarily the most crucial of all his values. In order to deal with existence successfully, to achieve the values and goals his life and well-being require, man needs to strive for an unobstructed cognitive contact with reality. This means that he must maintain a full mental focus, must seek the clearest possible awareness with regard to his actions and concerns and everything which bears upon them. If a man defaults on the responsibility of this task, the consequences are not merely the failure and defeats he suffers existentially. The deadlier penalty is the consequence for his ego, for his sense of himself. He is sentenced to the feeling that his mind is not a reliable instrument. Whatever a man may have the power to fake, he has no way to fake an efficacy his ego does not possess. If his mind is out of control, it is out of control. No rationalizations, no denials can wipe this fact out of existence or extinguish its psychological consequence, self-distrust. If a person refuses to give thought to issues which he knows clearly or dimly require his attention, he may evade the fact of his evasion, but the contradiction between his knowledge and his performance is a fact and cannot be escaped. The fact does not vanish. It is registered in his subconscious along with the knowledge that the evaded issues have not vanished either. The result is self-distrust. If a man establishes within his consciousness the principle that it is permissible to act with his mind unfocused, that he need not know what he is doing or why, that the difficult need not be thought about, that the painful need not be faced, that the undesirable need not be acknowledged, then this is the secret knowledge about its method of functioning that a man's ego cannot escape. This 
is the root of self-distrust, self-doubt, and guilt. When one considers the amount of reckless irrationality that most men permit themselves and regard as normal, one does not have to be astonished by the prevalence of so-called causeless fear. If men feel anxiously uncertain of their ability to deal with the facts of existence, they have given themselves ample grounds for their feeling. But pathological anxiety, we must remember, is pathological. That is, it's symptomatic of an abnormal and unhealthy condition. A state of chronic dread is not man's natural condition. The fact that man is neither omniscient, nor omnipotent, nor infallible, nor immortal does not constitute grounds for his ego to feel overwhelmed by a sense of inefficacy. A rational person does not set his standard of efficacy in opposition to his own nature and to the nature of reality. Neither is man born with any sort of original sin. If a man feels guilty, it is not because he is guilty by nature. Sin is not original, it is originated. The problem of anxiety is psychological, not metaphysical. To the extent that a person indulges in irrational, mind-subverting, psychoepistemological policies, he sentences himself to a chronic anticipation of disaster. If he fails to do the thinking his life and concerns require, he cannot escape the awareness that the range of his action exceeds the range of his thought, that challenges and demands will confront him to which he is inadequate. He feels afraid because of the thinking he failed to do and guilty because of the knowledge that he should have done it. If he acts contrary to his convictions, if he takes actions which he regards as wrong and or fails to take actions which he regards as right, he comes to experience the feeling not merely that his actions are wrong, but that he is wrong. He is wrong as a person, since a person's deepest sense of himself has its base and origin in his method of psychoepistemological functioning, in the processes by which his mind deals with reality. There is another related reason why a man who acts against his own moral convictions will suffer a sense of impending disaster. Whether the moral values a man accepts are rational or irrational, man cannot escape the knowledge that, in order to deal with reality successfully, in order to live, he needs some sort of moral principles to guide him. Implicit in this knowledge is the awareness that ethical principles are a practical necessity of his life on earth. A corollary of this awareness is his expectation that moral and immoral actions have consequences, even if he cannot always predict them. If he takes actions which he regards as good, he expects to benefit. If he takes actions which he regards as bad, he expects to suffer although this expectation is often evaded and repressed. Thus, what he is left with, if he betrays his own standards, is the sense of some unknown danger, some unknown retribution, waiting for him ahead. Let us consider an example. A man who has been married for ten years falls in love with another woman. For a long time, he has resisted identifying his marital dissatisfaction, as well as his feeling for the other woman. But gradually, the repression breaks down, and he finds himself daydreaming about the other woman more and more. He does not think the issue out consciously. He merely lets himself and the problem drift, in the hope that somehow a solution will come to him. One night, accidental circumstances bring him and the other woman together, and he begins an affair with her. He did not intend to begin an affair. His emotions made the decision for him. He feels guilty and represses the guilt, and continues to drift, evading the other woman's questions about their future. He's still waiting for the solution to come from somewhere. His wife decides to take a trip to visit her parents. As he stands at the airport watching her plane depart, the thought comes to him that if the plane crashed, he would be free and would have no further problems. But the wish is savagely thrust from his mind, along with a sudden burst of hostility toward his wife which he would never have admitted himself capable of experiencing. Driving home, he suddenly finds that he has difficulty distinguishing the colors of the signal lights. Everything in his field of vision seems to be swimming, and terrible pains appear to be coming from his heart. He feels that he is going to die of a heart attack, but what he is suffering from is a self-esteem attack. The collision is between I must not wish for my wife's death and I did and do and will wish for my wife's death. The clash is between a value imperative, engaging his sense of personal worth 
his self-esteem or pretense at it, and an emotion, a desire, which contradicts that imperative. Thus, he experiences a crisis of self-esteem. In every instance of pathological anxiety, there is a conflict between some value imperative that is tied in a crucial and profound way to the person's self-appraisal and some failure or inadequacy or action or emotion or desire that the person regards as a breach of that imperative. And it is a breach that the person believes expresses or reflects a basic and unalterable fact of his nature. One of the worst consequences of pathological anxiety is its destructive impact on the objectivity and clarity of a person's thinking. When a person doubts the efficacy of his mind, his tendency is to surrender to the guidance of his emotions, since they appear to possess a certainty and authority that his intellect lacks. His emotions are not a substitute for rational cognition at any time, but they are never a less reliable guide than in the midst of an anxiety state. Because the experience of anxiety is so intrinsically painful, neurotics adopt a vast variety of devices and techniques in order to defend themselves against it. Evasion, repression, and rationalization underlie most, if not all, of such defenses. The neurotic can blank out the reality of his objectionable actions. He can repress his unresolved conflicts. He can disown his guilt feelings. He can deny or rationalize his fear. He can seek to distract himself by the frenzied pursuit of various activities. He can avoid the challenge of the unfamiliar. He can elaborate a fantasized self-image to protect him from a self-evaluation he dreads to acknowledge. Often, the repression of the anxiety problem and of the conflicts underlying it results in the formation of other neurotic symptoms. One of these symptoms is particularly worthy of attention in the present context, neurotic depression. Depression, like anxiety, can be normal or pathological. Anxiety is a response to the threatened destruction or loss of a value. Depression is a response to the accomplished destruction or loss of a value. Anxiety is anticipatory and is directed to the future. Depression is directed to the past. Depression is regarded as pathological when it is unrelated to any objective loss or when its intensity and duration are grossly disproportionate to the loss. Neurotic depression is characterized by despair, passivity, a feeling that action and effort are futile, that nothing is worth doing, and by feelings of self-rejection and self-condemnation. Now, in what manner can depression relate to anxiety? A person is made anxious because of urgent demands, claims, or self-expectations which he feels unable to satisfy. For example, the imperative that he possess certain knowledge and be able to cope with certain responsibilities. He is caught in a conflict. Suppose that he attempts to minimize his anxiety by repressing both the conflict and the related guilt. In its place, on the conscious level of his awareness, he experiences a sense of passivity, futility, and general worthlessness. If one listens closely to his declarations that he is hopeless, that life is hopeless, that he is no good, one can discern another message to be read in his words, and that message is, expect nothing of me, demand nothing of me. Since he is incurably worthless, he is outside the realm of moral expectations. In this manner he resolves the conflict that threatens him with anxiety. In other words, he seeks to anticipate the worst and make it a fait incompli without coming to grips with his actual problem. Under the guise of renouncing his self-esteem, he is still secretly trying to protect it by neurotic means. This is one of the ways in which depression can be a subconsciously elected alternative to anxiety. Here is another, more indirect pattern. Suppose that a man, rightly or wrongly, accepts certain moral standards as essential criteria of his personal worth and yet in some crucial respect feels unable to comply with them. Or suppose he desires something desperately, which he regards as immoral, and therefore impossible to assert or pursue. The conflict, let us say, is repressed. Since it is repressed, it cannot be resolved. He can neither recheck his standards and discover whether he has made an error, nor can he form any rational policy in regard to the failure or action or desire that is in conflict with his self-expectations. He is left with the oppressive, 
enervating sense of some nameless, unalterable burden which he ascends to carry and live with to the end of his days. He has lost or minimized his anxiety. He may be comparatively free of conscious guilt, but what he experiences instead is despair, an exhausting despair that paralyzes the will to act. He has relinquished the possibility of achieving self-esteem or happiness. To regain his mental health, the depressed person must be willing to experience anxiety. He must be willing to relinquish the comfort of despair and to confront his anxiety-provoking conflicts in order to resolve them and move forward. Anxiety is still a sign of life, of conflict and struggle, and therefore a possible victory. But depression is resignation to defeat. Anxiety and guilt are painful and disruptive of clear objective thinking. But just as physical pain has a crucial survival value, warning a person that his body is in danger, so anxiety and guilt have the same survival value and perform the same function for man's mind and person. Man is free to ignore the warning signals of danger, but the warning is there, in the form of a penalty he cannot escape. And thus, paradoxically, Pathological anxiety is at once man's protector and his nemesis. If a man defaults on the responsibility of reason, then his self-betrayed ego becomes its own avenger. A man need not have solved his every psychological problem before he can be free of anxiety and guilt, but it is necessary that he correct the base of his problems, the policy of permitting some other considerations to take precedence over his perception of the facts of reality. The determination to face his problems, to look at reality, is the essential first step in the process by which a man sets himself free of fear and guilt. If and to the extent that this determination is maintained and implemented, psychological liberation will follow. Entailed by the process of achieving self-esteem is a corollary process, that of forming a strong positive sense of personal identity the sense of being a clearly defined psychological entity. A person's I, his ego, his deepest sense of self, is his faculty of awareness, his capacity to think. Across his lifetime, a person's knowledge grows, his convictions may change, his emotions come and go. But that which knows, judges, and feels, that is the changeless constant within him. To choose to think, to identify the facts of reality, to assume the responsibility of judging what is true or false, right or wrong, is man's basic form of self-assertiveness. It is his acceptance of his own nature as a rational being, his acceptance of the responsibility of intellectual independence, his commitment to the efficacy of his own mind. The hallmark of healthy self-assertiveness in a child is his visible delight in the action of his mind his desire for the new, the unexplored, the challenging, his refusal to accept on faith the platitudes of his elders. Add to that his insistent use of the word why, his boredom with routine, his hunger for that which will necessitate the fullest exercise of his powers, and thus allow him to achieve and experience the growing pride of self-esteem. Above all, as he grows and develops, such a child is the originator of his own goals. He does not look to others to tell him what will give him enjoyment. He does not expect and does not wish to be told what to do with his time, what to admire, what to pursue, and, years later, what career to select. He is a self-generator, and he welcomes he is not frightened by this responsibility. It is this policy, this attitude toward life and toward oneself, that results in the formation of a strong, positive sense of personal identity. The process of healthy growth to psychological maturity rests on a person's acceptance of intellectual responsibility for his own existence. As a human being grows to adulthood, reality confronts him with increasingly more complex challenges at each succeeding stage of his development. The range of thought, knowledge, judgment, and decision-making required of him at the age of twelve is greater than that required at the age of five. The range required at 20 is greater than that required at 12. At each stage, the responsibility demanded of him involves both cognition and evaluation. He has to acquire a knowledge of facts, and he has to pass value judgments and choose goals. The acceptance of full responsibility for this task is not automatic. 
The decision to function as an intellectually independent, self-responsible entity is not wired into his brain by nature. It is a challenge to which he responds positively or negatively by choice. Without ever confronting the issue in fully identified terms, the overwhelming majority of men begin retreating very early in life from the challenges of proper conceptual growth, and they die never having actualized more than a small fraction of their potential intelligence. The self-esteem deficiency expressed in the feeling of, Who am I to know? Who am I to judge? Who am I to decide? is the consequence of too many retreats from the responsibility of thought and judgment in situations where the person did not have to retreat, where an effort could and should have been made, but was not. Often this policy of self-abdication is wittingly or unwittingly encouraged by parents and other elders who act in such a way as to penalize intellectual independence and initiative on the part of the child, or the parents and other elders create an impression of such bewildering irrationality that the child simply gives up the effort to understand. By the same token, adults make a positive contribution to the child's proper development to the extent that they encourage and reward independence and self-responsibility. They also act in a consistent, predictable, intelligible manner which supports or implants in the child the conviction that he is living in a knowable world. The fear of relying on the judgment of one's own mind is felt most acutely in the realm of values because of the direct consequences of one's judgments for one's life and well-being. The evaluative errors that men make affect them personally far more often and far more devastatingly than do most of their cognitive errors. To assume responsibility for choosing the values that guide one's life, the principles by which to act, the goals in which to seek happiness, to make such judgments alone, relying solely upon one's own reason and understanding, is to practice the ultimate form of intellectual independence, the one most dreaded by the overwhelming majority of men. Still another reason why the fear of independence is most intense in the sphere of value judgments is the fact that independence in this area is most likely to bring a person into conflict with other people. Cognitive differences do not necessarily generate personal animosity among people. Value differences commonly do. Therefore, independence in the sphere of value judgments is more demanding psychologically. Since a social form of existence is proper to man, since he has many benefits to derive from living among and dealing with his fellow men, it should be recognized that the desire to have a harmonious relationship with his fellow men is a reasonable one. It becomes unreasonable only if and when a man subordinates his mind and judgment to that desire. In other words, if he places that desire above his perception of reality. For some persons who dread intellectual self-reliance, there is still another motive involved. The process of rational thought and judgment is necessarily a process that a man performs alone. Men can learn from one another, but they cannot share the act of thinking. It is a solitary process, not a social one. There are men who dread independent thought and judgment precisely for this reason. It makes them aware of their separateness as living entities. It makes them aware of the responsibility they must bear for their own existence. It forces them to face their own being, and thus to confront the terror of their own state of non-being. To think, to judge, to choose one's values, is to be individuated, to create a distinct personal identity. But there are many people who, in their deepest emotions, do not want personal identity, however much they may scream to their psychiatrists that they are tormented by a sense of inner emptiness. This psychology represents the most profound form of rebellion against one's nature as man, the attempt to escape the responsibility of being human. Fear of intellectual independence can exist in various degrees of intensity. What are its consequences when it is the dominant element in a person's psychology? There is no escape from the facts of reality, no escape from man's nature or the manner of survival his nature requires. Every living species that possesses awareness can survive only by the guidance of its consciousness. If a person rejects his distinctive form of consciousness, 
if he decides that thinking is too much effort or that choosing the values needed to guide his actions is too frightening a responsibility, then, if he wants to survive and to function in the world, he can do so only by means of the minds of others. He can do so only by means of their conclusions, their judgments, their values. He knows, consciously or subconsciously, that he does not know what to do and that knowledge is required to make decisions in the face of the countless alternatives that confront him every day of his life. But others seem to know how to live and function. So the only way to exist, he feels, is to follow their lead and live by their knowledge. They will spare him the effort and the risk. He does not begin by choosing to be an intellectual dependent. He begins by failing to assume the responsibility of thinking and judging on his own. Then he is forced into the position of a dependent. A person of self-esteem deals with reality, with nature, with an objective universe of facts. He holds his mind as his tool of survival and develops his ability to think. But the psychoepistemological dependent lives not in a universe of facts, but a universe of people. People, not facts, are his reality. Reality is reality as perceived by them. It is on them that his consciousness must focus. It is they who he must understand or please or placate or deceive or maneuver or manipulate or obey. To grasp and successfully to satisfy the expectations, conditions, demands, terms, values of others is experienced by him as his deepest, most urgent need. The temporary diminution of his anxiety, which the approval of others offers him, is his substitute for self-esteem. This is the phenomenon that I call social metaphysics. Remember that metaphysics is one's view of the nature of reality. To the psychoepistemological dependent, reality is people. In his thinking, people occupy the place which, in the mind of a rational person, is occupied by reality. Social metaphysics, then, is the psychological syndrome that characterizes a person who holds the minds of other people, not objective reality, as his ultimate frame of reference. Since the social metaphysician's pseudo-self-esteem rests on his ability to deal with the world as perceived by others, his fear of disapproval or condemnation is the fear of being pronounced inadequate to reality, unfit for existence, devoid of personal worth. In order to belong with others, the social metaphysician is willing to belong to them. Since, however, he is seeking a manner of survival improper to man by nature, he condemns himself to chronic insecurity and to a fear of other men that is profoundly humiliating. The nature of his humiliation and fear, however, are seldom identified by him because he would find it too degrading. Most often he seeks to protect his pseudo-self-esteem by evading the humiliation and rationalizing the fear. Such men, prompted by a fear they dare not acknowledge and so cannot overcome, invent non-existent dangers or grossly exaggerate minor ones, betray their own minds, sell out whatever authentic rationality they possess, and they acquire a vested interest in believing that men are unavoidably evil, that human existence is evil, that the good has no chance on earth. Consider the case of a successful playwright who selects some important theme as a subject of a play, a theme deserving a serious, dramatic presentation, and then realizes that his viewpoint will antagonize a great many people. He decides, therefore, to write the play as a comedy, making good-natured fun of the things he regards as evil, counting on his humor to prevent anyone from taking his view seriously and being offended or antagonized. He does not tell himself that he dreads to be regarded as unfashionable. Instead, he tells himself that serious plays dealing with controversial ideas are non-commercial but he cannot entirely elude the knowledge that he has sold out the motive that prompted his desire to write the play in the first place. So, he retaliates against this discomforting sense of moral uncleanliness by cursing the stupidity and bad taste of the masses. To the extent that men irrationally surrender to fear, they increase the power of fear over their lives more and more things acquire the power to invoke fear in them. Their self-confidence diminishes and their sense of danger grows. 
With every surrender to the consciousness of others, with every success of betrayal, the social metaphysician's sense of alienation from reality worsens and his sense of impotence finds confirmation. There are many different types of social metaphysicians. The following traits, however, are common to all. The absence of a firm, unyielding concept of existence, facts, reality, as apart from the judgments, beliefs, opinions, feelings of others. A sense of fundamental helplessness or impotence. A feeling of metaphysical inefficacy. A profound fear of other people and an implicit belief that other people control that unknowable realm, reality. A pseudo-self-esteem that is tied to and dependent on the responses of the significant others. And a tragic or malevolent sense of life. A belief that the universe is essentially inimical to one's interests. The most fundamental of these traits, the one that makes all the others inevitable, is the absence of a firm, independent sense of objective reality. This is the vacuum that is filled by the consciousness of others, and this is the void that is responsible for that desolate feeling of alienation which is every social metaphysician's chronic torture. It is important to observe that the experience of self-alienation and the feeling of being alienated from the world around one proceed from the same cause, one's default on the responsibility of thinking. The suspension of proper cognitive contact with reality and the suspension of one's ego are a single act. A flight from reality is a flight from self. The most common and easily identifiable type of social metaphysician is the person whose values and view of life are a direct reflection and product of his particular culture or subculture. This is the person who is sometimes described as a conformist. I shall designate this type as the conventional social metaphysician. This is the person who accepts the world and its prevailing values ready-made. His is not to reason why. What is true? What others say is true. What is right? What others believe is right. How should one live as others live? Why does one work for a living? Because one is supposed to. Why does one get married? Because one is supposed to. Why does one have children? Because one is supposed to. Why does one go to church? Oh, please don't start discussing religion. You might offend someone. This is the person for whom reality is the world as interpreted by the significant others of his social environment. This is the person whose sense of identity and personal worth is a function of his ability to satisfy the values, terms, and expectations of others as he imagines them. This is the type of man without whom no dictatorship could establish itself or remain in existence. He is the man who, in response to advanced signs of danger, closes his eyes. This, lest he be compelled to pass independent value judgments and to recognize that his world is not safe, that action and protest are demanded of him, that the policies and goals of his leaders are evil, and that the significant others are wrong. In the midst of atrocities, he tells himself that the authorities must have their reasons, in order to escape the terror of knowing to whom and to what he has surrendered his existence. It is the same man who, usually when it is too late, will sometimes rebel in hysterical indignation when the atrocities have come too close and cannot be evaded any longer. And the same man may die senselessly in ineffectual protest, screaming at the malevolent omnipotence of the enemy and wondering who or what had made the enemy's power possible. The conventional type is the most blatant and uncomplicated species of social metaphysician. He represents the paradigm case, so to speak, the basic pattern that serves as a reference point with regard to which other species of social metaphysicians may be understood. Another type of social metaphysician is the power seeker. In this type, fear of others is especially pronounced. He finds his fear intolerable, and his reaction is an overriding emotion of hatred. The hatred is aimed at those who invoke his fear. Resentment and hostility are his dominant emotional traits. The power-seeking social metaphysician feels too unsure of his ability to gain the love and approval he desires. His sense of inferiority is overwhelming, and the humiliation of his dependence infuriates him. 
He longs for an escape from the uncertainty of free market social metaphysical competition where he must win men's voluntary esteem. He wants to deceive, to manipulate, to coerce the minds of others, to leave them no choice in the matter. He wants to reach a position where he can command respect, obedience, love. As an example, consider King Frederick Wilhelm of Prussia, who would beat his subjects while shouting at them, You must not fear me, you must love me. This is the psychology of any dictator from Hitler to Stalin to Khrushchev to Castro to Mao. Fear is the emotion which power-seeking social metaphysicians understand best. The absence of fear in any person they deal with robs them of their delusion of efficacy. Their sense of personal identity tends to evaporate in such a person's presence. Faced with the question, what am I to do with my life, or what will make me happy, the conventional social metaphysician seeks the answer among the standard values of his culture. Respectability, financial success, marriage, family, professional competence, and so on. Faced with the question, how am I to make my existence endurable, the power-seeking social metaphysician seeks the answer in aggressive and destructive action aimed at the external object of his fear, other people. Consider next the psychology of what I call the spiritual social metaphysician. This type does not seek to please and placate people in the manner of a conventional social metaphysician or to gain power over them like a power seeker. This type often does virtually nothing at all. His chief virtue, he proclaims or implies, is that he is too good for this world. He must not be expected to conform to conventional standards. He must not be expected to achieve anything tangible. His friends and acquaintances must love and respect him, not for anything he does, but for what he is. The spiritual social metaphysician's claim to esteem rests on his alleged possession of a superior kind of soul, a soul that is not his mind, not his thoughts, not his values, not anything specifiable, but an ineffable composite of undefinable longings, incommunicable insights, and impenetrable mystery. If and when he fails to receive the acceptance and esteem he craves, he explains to himself that people are not fine enough to appreciate the real him. He may even prefer to be alone, to avoid people. The better to dream undisturbed about how he would be admired and loved if only people knew what he was really like deep inside. It should be added that there are moments when the thought of people knowing what he is really like fills him with terror. An overactive fantasy life is often characteristic of this type. He sees himself as a religious saint, or an inspired statesman, or a renowned poet, or a sexually irresistible Don Juan. The extreme case of this mentality is a subtype which may be designated as the religious fanatic social metaphysician. This type of person can dissociate himself from the human race altogether, with God as his significant other, as the object of his social metaphysical attachment. Having despaired of impressing his fellow men, it is God whom he seeks to impress. Since God cannot frown at him, or snub him socially, or inquire as to why he doesn't get a job, the religious fanatic type is free to imagine that God is smiling down at him, blessing and protecting him, responding to the true nobility of his soul, which everyone on earth is too superficial or corrupt to do. Then there is the independent social metaphysician. This is the counterfeit individualist, the man who rebels against the status quo for the sake of being rebellious, the man whose pseudo-self-esteem is tied to the picture of himself as a defiant nonconformist. This is the rebel who fulfills his concept of profundity and self-expression by proclaiming that everything stinks. This is the nihilist. This is the hippie. This is the quote-unquote individualist who proves it by scorning money, marriage, jobs, baths, and haircuts. Overwhelmed by feelings of inadequacy in relation to the conventional standards of his culture, this type of person retaliates with the formula, whatever is, is wrong. Overwhelmed by the belief that no one can possibly like or accept him, he goes out of his way to insult people, lest they imagine that he desires their approval. Overwhelmed with humiliation at feeling himself an outcast, he struggles to conquer his sense of non-identity by maintaining that to be an outcast is proof of one's superiority. While he may profess devotion to some particular idea or goal, his primary motivation is negative rather than positive. He is against rather than for. 
He does not originate or struggle for positive values of his own, he merely rebels against the values and standards of others. This, as if the absence of passive conformity, rather than the presence of independent rational judgment, were the hallmark of self-reliance and spiritual sovereignty. It is by means of this delusion that he seeks to escape the fact of his inner emptiness. There is, finally, a type of social metaphysician that differs in important respects from all the foregoing varieties I have described. I call this type the ambivalent social metaphysician. This is the person who has still preserved a significant degree of intellectual sovereignty. The ambivalent type seldom dares to question the fundamental values of his social environment, but he is often indifferent to these values, paying them only perfunctory respect. In the areas of life to which these values pertain, he does not assert counter-values of his own, he merely withdraws, surrendering those aspects of reality to others. He tends to restrict his activity and concern to the sphere of his work, where his self-reliance and sovereignty are greatest. His superiority to other social metaphysicians is evidenced not only by his greater independence, but also by his desire to earn the esteem he longs for, by his relative inability to find real pleasure in an admiration not based on standards he can respect, and by his tortured disgust at his own fear of the disapproval of others. Among this type, one will find men of distinguished achievements and outstanding creative originality, men whose treason and tragedy lie in the contrast between their private lives and their lives as creators. These are the men who have the courage to challenge the cognitive judgments of world figures, but lack the courage to challenge the value judgments of the folks next door. It must be understood that none of the social metaphysical types I have described are intended to represent mutually exclusive categories. Any particular social metaphysician may possess characteristics of several types. The purpose of such a typological description is to isolate certain dominant trends among social metaphysicians. The forms that social metaphysics can take are virtually unlimited. But if one grasps the principles involved, one will be better able to understand the appalling consequences to which such social metaphysics leads. It has been barely possible here to hint at those consequences. The full story cannot be told in so brief a discussion, but it is written in blood across the pages of history. Now, let's examine the psychology of sex and romantic love and their relationship to self-esteem. The two sources of greatest potential happiness for human beings are productive work and romantic love. Through the productive use of his mind, man gains control over his existence and experiences the pleasure and pride of efficacy. Through romantic love, man gains the ultimate emotional reward of his efficacy and worth, of his efficacy and worth not merely as a producer, but as a person, the reward and celebration of himself and of what he has made of himself that is, of the kind of character and soul he has created. The experience of romantic love answers a profound psychological need in people, but the nature of that need cannot be understood apart from an understanding of a wider need, that is, man's need of human companionship, of human beings he can respect, admire, and value, and with whom he can interact intellectually and emotionally. Everyone is aware of the desire for companionship, for someone to talk to, to be with, to feel understood by, to share important experiences with, the desire for emotional closeness with another human being. What is the nature of the psychological need that generates this desire? I shall begin by giving an account of two events that were crucial in leading me to the answer, because I believe this will help you to understand the issues involved. One afternoon, while sitting alone in my living room, I found myself contemplating with pleasure a large philodendron plant standing against a wall. It suddenly occurred to me to ask, What is the nature of this pleasure? What is its cause? Essential to my enjoyment was the knowledge that the plant was healthfully and glowingly alive. There was the feeling of a bond, almost a kind of kinship, between the plant and me. In the midst of inanimate objects, we were united in the fact of possessing life. Suppose, I thought, one were on a dead planet where one had every material provision to ensure survival, but where nothing was alive. Then suppose one came upon a living plant. 
surely one would greet the sight with eagerness and pleasure. Why? Because, I realized, all life by its very nature entails a struggle, and struggle entails the possibility of defeat. Man finds pleasure in seeing concrete instances of successful life, as confirmation of his knowledge that successful life is possible. It is, in effect, a metaphysical experience. If such is the value that a plant can offer to man, I wondered, then cannot the sight of another human being offer man a much more intense form of that experience? The next crucial step in my thinking occurred on an afternoon when I sat on the floor playing with my dog, a wire-haired fox terrier named Mutnik. We were boxing with each other in mock ferociousness. What I found delightful and fascinating was the extent to which Mutnik appeared to grasp the playfulness of my intention. She was snarling and snapping and striking back, while being unfailingly gentle in a manner that projected total fearless trust. The event was not unusual. It is one with which most dog owners are familiar. But a question suddenly occurred to me. Why am I having such an enjoyable time? What is the nature and source of my pleasure? Part of my response, I recognized, was simply the pleasure of watching the healthy self-assertiveness of a living entity. But the essential factor causing my response pertained to the interaction between the dog and myself, the sense of interacting and communicating with a living consciousness. Suppose I were to view Mutnik as an automaton without consciousness or awareness, and to view her actions and responses as entirely mechanical. Then my enjoyment would vanish. The factor of consciousness was of primary importance. Then I thought, Suppose I were left on an uninhabited island. Would not the presence of Mutnik be an enormous value to me? Obviously it would. Because she could make a practical contribution to my physical survival? Obviously not. Then what value did she have to offer? Companionship. A conscious entity with whom to interact and communicate as I was doing now. But why is that a value? The answer to this question, I realize, would explain much more than the attachment to a pet. Involved in this issue is the psychological principle that underlies man's desire for human companionship. It is the principle that would explain why a conscious entity seeks out and values other conscious entities, why consciousness is a value to consciousness. When I identified the answer, I called it the Mutnik principle, because of the circumstances under which it was discovered. Now let us consider the nature of this principle. My feeling of pleasure in playing with Mutnik contained a particular kind of self-awareness. The self-awareness came from the nature of the feedback Mutnik was providing. From the moment I began to playfully box, she responded in an equally playful manner. She conveyed no sign of feeling threatened. She projected an attitude of trust and pleasurable excitement. The effect of Mutnik's behavior was to make me feel seen, to make me feel psychologically visible. Mutnik was responding to me not as to a mechanical object, but as to a person. What is significant is that Mutnik was responding to me as a person in a way that I regarded as objectively appropriate. Had she responded with fear and an attitude of cowering, I would have experienced myself as being misperceived by her and would not have felt pleasure. Now, why does man find pleasure in the experience of self-awareness and psychological visibility that the appropriate feedback from another consciousness can evoke? Consider the fact that normally man experiences himself as a process, in that consciousness itself is a process, and the contents of man's mind are a shifting flow of perceptions, thoughts, and emotions. His own mind is not an unmoving entity which man can contemplate objectively as he contemplates objects in the external world. He has, of course, a sense of himself, of his own identity, but it is experienced more as a feeling than a thought, a feeling which is very diffuse, which is interwoven with all his other feelings, and which is very hard, if not impossible, to isolate and consider by itself. His self-concept is not a single concept, actually, but a cluster of images and abstract perspectives on his various real or imagined traits and characteristics, the sum total of which can never be held in focal awareness at any one time. That sum is experienced, 
but it is not perceived as such. When a man stands before a mirror, he is able to perceive his own face as an object in reality, and he finds pleasure in doing so, in contemplating the physical entity who is himself. There is a value in being able to look and think, that's me. Is there a mirror in which man can perceive his psychological self, in which, in effect, he can perceive his own soul? Yes, the mirror is another consciousness. Man is able alone to know himself conceptually. What another consciousness can offer is the opportunity for man to experience himself perceptually. To a very small extent, that was the opportunity afforded me by Mutnik. In her response, I was able to see reflected an aspect of my own personality. But a human being can experience this self-awareness to a full and proper extent only in a relationship with a consciousness like his own, that is, another human being. Just as there are many different aspects of a man's personality and inner life, so a man may feel visible in different respects in different human relationships. He may experience a greater or lesser degree of visibility over a wider or narrower range of his total personality, depending on the nature of the person with whom he is dealing and on the nature of their interaction. The mere fact of holding a conversation with another human being entails a marginal experience of visibility, if only the experience of being perceived as a conscious entity. However, in a close human relationship with a person one deeply admires and cares for, one expects a far more profound visibility involving highly individual and intimate aspects of one's inner life. A friend, said Aristotle, is another self. It was an apt formulation. A friend reacts to a man as the man would react to himself in the person of another. Thus, the man perceives himself through his friend's reaction. He perceives his own person through its consequences, in the consciousness and behavior of the perceiver. This, then, is the root of man's desire for companionship and love. It is the desire to perceive himself as an entity in reality through the reactions and responses of other human beings. In any given relationship, the extent to which a man achieves this experience depends crucially on two factors. First, the extent of the mutuality of mind and values that exists between himself and the other person. Second, the extent to which his self-image corresponds to the actual facts of his psychology, that is, the extent to which he knows himself and judges himself correctly. The desire for visibility is usually experienced by men as the desire to be understood by other human beings. If a man is happy and proud of some achievement, he wants to feel that those who are close to him understand his achievement and its personal meaning to him understand and attach importance to the reasons behind his emotions. Or, if a man is given a book by a friend and told that this is the kind of book he will enjoy, the man feels pleasure and gratification if his friend's judgment proves correct, because he feels visible, he feels understood. Or, if a man suffers over some personal loss, it is a value to him to know that his plight is understood by those close to him, and that his emotional state has reality to them. It is not blind acceptance, this must be emphasized, it is not blind acceptance that a normal person desires, nor unconditional, quote-unquote, love, but rather, understanding. The great majority of contemporary psychologists regard man, in effect, as a social metaphysician by nature, who needs the approval of others in order to approve of himself. But it would be a gross error to confuse the motives of the social metaphysician, which are pathological, with a healthy person's desire for visibility. A psychologically healthy person does not depend on others, primarily, for his self-esteem. He expects others to perceive his value, not to create it. Unlike the social metaphysician, he does not desire approval indiscriminately or for its own sake. The admiration of others is of value and importance to him only if he respects the standards by which others judge him and only if the admiration is directed at qualities which he himself regards as admirable. If other men give authentic evidence of understanding and appreciating him, they rise in his estimation. His estimate of himself does not change. He desires the experience of living in a rational and just social environment, where the responses he elicits from other men are logically related to his own virtues and achievements. 
He knows the truth about his own character and actions conceptually. He wants to experience it perceptually, through and by means of its consequences in persons who share his values. As for social metaphysicians, it is not visibility they seek from others, but identity. The desire for visibility does not mean that a psychologically healthy person's basic preoccupation in any human encounter is with the question of whether or not he is properly appreciated. When a person of self-esteem meets a person for the first time, his primary concern is not, what does he think of me, but rather, what do I think of him? His primary concern necessarily is with his own judgment and evaluation of the facts that confront him. Entailed by man's desire to see his values objectified in reality is the desire to see his own values embodied in the persons of others, to see human beings who face life as he faces it. That sight offers man a reaffirmation of his own view of existence. A man can feel visible in different respects and to varying degrees in different human relationships. A relationship with a casual stranger does not afford man the degree of visibility he experiences with an acquaintance. A relationship with an acquaintance does not afford man the degree of visibility he experiences with an intimate friend. But there is one relationship which is unique in the depth and comprehensiveness of the visibility it entails. Romantic love. Contained in every human being's self-concept is the awareness of being male or female. One's sexual identity, the way one psychologically experiences one's maleness or femaleness, is normally an integral and intimate part of one's experience of personal identity. One's psychosexual identity is the product and reflection of the manner in which one responds to one's nature as a sexual being just as one's personal identity is the product and reflection of the manner in which one responds to one's nature as a human being. To what extent is one aware of oneself as a sexual entity? What is one's view of sex and of its significance in human life? How does one feel about one's own body? How does one view the opposite sex? How does one identify the respective sexual roles of man and woman? How does one evaluate one's own sexual role? It is his answers to such questions that determine a human being's sexual psychology. The single most pertinent factor in determining a person's sexual attitudes is the general level of his self-esteem. The higher the level of self-esteem, the stronger the likelihood that his responses to his own sexuality will be appropriate and that he will exhibit a healthy sex psychology. A healthy masculinity or femininity is the consequence and expression of a rationally affirmative response to one's own sexual nature. What does this entail? A strong affirmative awareness of one's own sexuality, a positive response to the phenomenon of sex, a perspective on sex that sees it as integrated to one's mind and values, not as a dissociated mindless and meaningless physical indulgence, a positive and self-valuing response to one's own body and the body of the opposite sex, and a confident understanding, acceptance, and enjoyment of one's own sexual role. Just as one's sexual personality is essential to one's sense of oneself, so it is essential to that which one wishes to objectify and to see reflected or made visible in human relationships. The experience of full visibility and full self-objectification entails being perceived and perceiving oneself not merely as a certain kind of human being, but as a certain kind of man or woman. It should be clear why the optimal experience of visibility and self-objectification requires interaction with a member of the opposite sex. One's sexual personality can be perceived and appreciated abstractly by one's friend, but it cannot be of great personal importance to him. A member of the opposite sex, with whom one enjoys a strong mutuality of mind and values, is capable of perceiving and personally responding to one in both areas. Romantic love, then, involves one's sense of visibility, not merely as a human being, but as a man or a woman. I want to stress that this experience of full visibility exists only as a potential in relation to the opposite sex, not as an automatic actuality. Whether or not a man and woman of the same basic values and sense of life will respond fully and personally to each other depends on many factors. These may include the context or circumstances in which their relationship occurs, the nature of their respective interests, the presence or absence on either side of emotional involvements elsewhere, 
the presence or absence of repression in one or both, and so on. Further, a man and woman may be in love while not enjoying a full unity of mind and values if there are major and basic areas of affinity and mutuality between them. Even if they do not feel optimally visible to each other, they may feel visible to a significant and enjoyable extent. Let me mention, as an aside, that I am using heterosexual relationships as my basic model because that encompasses the great majority of the human race. But there is very little of anything I am saying about romantic love here that is not equally applicable to gay relationships. Love is an emotional response that involves two basic related aspects. One regards the loved object as possessing or embodying qualities that one values highly, and as a consequence, one regards the loved object as a source of pleasure. This applies to any category of love, not only romantic love. In the case of romantic love, which is the most intense, positive emotional response one human being can offer another, one sees the loved object as possessing or embodying one's highest values and as being crucially important to one's personal happiness. Further, one sees the loved object as being crucially important to one's sexual happiness. This is one of the defining characteristics of romantic love. It is in a person's romantic sexual choices that his view of himself and of existence stands eloquently revealed. A man falls in love with and sexually desires the woman who reflects his deepest values. A man of self-esteem, a man in love with himself and with life, feels an intense need to find human beings he can admire, and to find a spiritual equal whom he can love. The quality that will attract him most is self-esteem, self-esteem and an unclouded sense of the value of existence. To such a man, sex is an act of celebration. Its meaning is a tribute to himself and to the woman he has chosen, the ultimate form of experiencing concretely and in his own person the value and joy of being alive. The need for such an experience is inherent in man's nature. But if a man lacks the self-esteem to earn it, he attempts to fake it. He chooses his partner subconsciously by the standard of her ability to help him fake it, to give him the illusion of a self-value he does not possess, and of a happiness he does not feel. The same principle, of course, applies to a woman's romantic sexual choices. More than any other relationship, Romantic love involves the objectification of one's self-value. Romantic love involves fundamental visibility. The essence of the romantic love response is, I see you as a person, and because you are what you are, I desire you for my sexual happiness. To understand why this is the most profound personal tribute one person can pay another, and why romantic love involves the most intense expression and objectification of one's self-value, we must consider certain facts about the nature and meaning of sex. Of all the pleasures that a person can experience, sex is, potentially, the most intense. There are other pleasures that can last longer across time, but none that is comparable in strength and intensity. Sex is unique among pleasures in its integration of mind and body. It integrates perceptions, emotions, values, and thought. It offers an individual the most intense form of experiencing his own total being, of experiencing his deepest and most intimate sense of his self. In sex, one's own person becomes a direct immediate source of pleasure. And since pleasure is experienced by man as the good, sex offers him the most intense and immediate form of experiencing himself as good, meaning as a value. Further. Sex offers man the most intense and immediate form of experiencing life as a value. His self-esteem exists in a man's mind as an abstraction. Its meaning is that he is competent to achieve his values and therefore to achieve happiness, and that he is worthy of doing so. The pleasure he experiences in the act of sex is the direct, immediate, sensory confirmation and reaffirmation of that conviction. His conviction that life is a value, that life is worth living, exists in a man's mind as an abstraction. Its meaning is the conviction that the nature of life is such that happiness is within his power to achieve. The pleasure he experiences in the act of sex is the confirmation and reaffirmation of that conviction. And thus, sex is the ultimate form in which man experiences perceptually that he is good and that life is good. 
Sex affords an individual the most intensely pleasurable form of self-awareness. In romantic love, when a man and woman project that they desire to achieve this experience by means of each other's person, that is the highest and most intimate tribute a human being can offer or receive. That is the ultimate form of acknowledging the value of the person one desires and of having one's own value acknowledged. It is in this sense that romantic love involves an intense objectification of one's self-value. One sees that value reflected and made visible in the romantic response of one's partner. A crucial element involved in this experience is the perception of one's efficacy as a source of pleasure to the being one loves. One feels that it is one's person, not merely one's body, that is the cause of the pleasure felt by one's partner. Thus, one sees one's own soul and its value in the emotions on the face of one's partner. If in sex one desires the freedom to be spontaneous, to be emotionally open and uninhibited, to assert one's right to pleasure, and to flaunt one's pleasure in oneself, then the person one most desires is a person with whom one feels freest to be oneself. The person one most desires is the person whom one regards as one's proper psychological mirror, the person who reflects one's deepest view of oneself and of life. That is the person who will allow one to experience optimally the things one wishes to experience in the realm of sex. Most people experience great difficulty in identifying the cause of their romantic sexual choices, not only because most people are poor introspectors, but also because the factors that bring about a romantic attraction between two individuals are enormously complex. I spoke of a mutuality of mind and values, but that's a very wide abstraction. What more specifically does it entail? To answer that question, we must consider a concept that is basic to an understanding of romantic love, the concept of sense of life. A sense of life is the emotional form in which a person experiences his deepest view of existence and of his own relationship to existence. It is the subconsciously integrated sum of a person's broadest and deepest conclusions about the world, about life, and about himself. The formulation of a sense of life begins in early childhood, long before the child is able to think about the world and himself in philosophical terms. The conscious philosophical convictions he acquires later may or may not be in accord with his sense of life. This depends on such factors as how rational he is, how conceptually reflective about his own life, and how well integrated psychologically. In the course of his development from childhood, a human being encounters certain fundamental facts of reality, facts about the nature of existence and the nature of man, to which he can respond in a variety of ways and with varying degrees of rationality and realism. It is the cumulative sum of these responses that constitutes a person's distinctive sense of life. For example, it is an inescapable fact of reality that thinking is a necessity of man's existence, that man requires knowledge, and that the acquisition of knowledge requires the effort of conceptual thought. The position a young person takes on this issue is not arrived at by explicit decision nor by a single choice. It is arrived at by the cumulative implication of a long series of choices and responses in the face of specific situations involving the need to think. A young person may respond positively and healthily, learning to take an act of pleasure in the exercise of his mind, or he may approach intellectual effort grudgingly and dutifully, viewing it in effect as a necessary evil. Or he may regard intellectual effort with lethargic resentment or fear, viewing it as an unfair burden and imposition, and determine to avoid it whenever possible. What gradually forms and hardens in his psychology is a trend, a policy, a habit, a position or premise by implication. It is in this manner that all sense of life attitudes are formed. The cumulative result of such responses is a generalized feeling about oneself, about existence, and about one's relationship to existence. A person's sense of life can reflect an unbreached self-esteem and an undiluted sense of the value of existence, the conviction that the universe is open to the efficacy of one's thought and effort, or it can reflect the torture of self-doubt, and the anxiety of feeling that one lives in a universe which is both unintelligible and hostile. 
It can reflect a view of life as exaltation or a view of life as tragic doom, a view of life as adventure or a view of life as frustration, a view of life as beauty or a view of life as sordid senselessness. It can embody eagerness and self-confidence or self-loathing and embittered resentment or muted wistful longing or anguished tragic defiance or gentle uncomplaining resignation or aggressive impotence. A person's sense of life is of crucial importance in the formation of his basic values, since all value choices rest on an implicit view of the being who values, and of the world in which he must act. A person's sense of life underlies all his other feelings, all his emotional responses. It is like the light motif of his soul, the basic theme of his personality. This is especially evident in the sphere of his romantic sexual responses. Just as one's own sense of life can be very difficult to isolate and identify conceptually, so it is very difficult to isolate and identify the sense of life of another human being. However, in romantic relationships, the affirmative response of each party to the sense of life of the other is crucial to the experience of love and to the projection of mutual visibility. There are many ways in which a sense of life affinity is communicated but perhaps the rarest is by explicit conceptual statement. Two people discover their affinity by learning of each other's values and disvalues, and by such means as observing each other's manner of talking, of smiling, of standing, of moving, of expressing emotions, of reacting to events, and so on. They discover it by the way they react to each other, by the things that are said and by the things that are not said, by the explanations it is not necessary to give, by sudden, unexpected signs of mutual understanding. Without a significant sense of life affinity, no fundamental and intimate experience of visibility is possible. One may be admired for some particular quality or qualities by a person with an alien sense of life, but one's feeling of gratification, if any, would be extremely limited. One would sense that the basic frame of reference of the other person the basic context from which one is being viewed and appraised is different from one's own, and one would conclude that the admiration does not mean what it would mean in one's own context. For example, suppose that a person with a self-confident affirmative sense of life is admired by a person whose own sense of life is defiantly tragic, so that the admiration projected is for the image of a heroic but doomed martyr. The recipient of such admiration would not feel properly visible because the image would clash with his own non-tragic sense of himself. In romantic love optimally experienced, one is admired for the things one wishes to be admired for, and equally important, in a way and from a perspective that is in accord with one's own view of life. That is full visibility. As a consequence of the fact that a person's sense of life and his avowed philosophy may be inconsistent, and of the fact that a sense of life can be very hard to identify, people are often tempted to feel that love is inexplicable. They feel that it is just there, that it is not susceptible to rational analysis. An individual may be at a loss to explain why he feels uniquely visible, uniquely in emotional accord with one particular person and not with another, who on the surface may appear to be an equally plausible romantic partner. If a person wishes to identify the ultimate grounds of his romantic feeling for another human being, the questions to ask and answer are these. What does this relationship make me feel about myself? What is the distinctive nature of the self-experience it produces in me, and why? What attitudes, characteristics, and actions of the person I love are essential in giving me this experience? The answers to these questions will tell a person a great deal not only about the nature of his romantic feeling, but also about the nature of his self-esteem and about his deepest image of himself. We have seen that self-esteem is the hallmark of mental health. It is the consequence, expression, and reward of a mind fully committed to reason. Commitment to reason is commitment to the maintenance of a full intellectual focus, to the constant expansion of one's understanding and knowledge. It is a commitment to the principle that one's actions must be consistent with one's convictions and that one must not attempt to fake reality or place any consideration above reality. 
It is a commitment that one must not permit oneself contradictions, and one must not attempt to subvert or sabotage the proper function of consciousness. In our analysis of needs, I discuss the fact that the frustration of a need does not necessarily result in the immediate or direct death of the organism. It can result instead in a general lowering of the ability of an organism to function, a diminution of the organism's effectiveness and power. This is applicable to psychological needs in general and to the need of self-esteem in particular. Obviously, people do not normally die from a deficiency of self-esteem, but the extent of that deficiency is the extent of their inability to live and to enjoy life. That ability or inability is measured in terms of a person's capacity to optimize his intellectual and creative potential, to translate that potential into productive achievement, to function effectively and unimpededly on the emotional as well as on the intellectual level, to love and to give objective expression to his love, and to explore the challenges and reap the rewards that human existence offers to man. In order to deal with reality successfully, to pursue and achieve the values which his life and happiness require, man needs self-esteem. He needs to be confident of his efficacy and worth. Anxiety and guilt, the antipodes of self-esteem, and the insignia of mental illness are the disintegrators of thought, the distorters of values, and the paralyzers of action. When a person of self-esteem chooses his values and sets his goals, when he projects the long-range purposes that will unify and guide his actions, it is like a bridge thrown to the future. It is like a bridge across which his life will pass.